Hi, Madam Clerk. Am I muted?
Madam Clerk? Where's Jerry? There he is. All right, Madam Clerk, how are you? Good morning, Good Madam morning. Mayor. Do we have our tech issues cleared up? We are all ready if you are. Are we? Okay, perfect. All right, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here this morning. Uh, it is Wednesday, March 27th, 2024, and we are going to begin the city council meeting at this time. Can you turn us up just a touch? Oh, is, can you hear me? Sorry, Madam Mayor. Let us turn the volume up just a touch. Okay. Perfect, thank you. All right, thank you so much. Okay, so we are going to start off with the Pledge of Allegiance. Jerry Misford, would you like to lead us in the pledge? All right, Madam Clerk, I'm going to send it right back to you for roll call. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Calling roll for Wednesday, March 27th. Councilmember Breckis? Here. Dewar? Here. Martinez? Here. Ebert, absent at this time. Taylor? Here. Reese? Here. Sheevy? Here. Madam Mayor, you do have a quorum of the Reno City Council. Okay, thank you so much. We're going to go into item A3, and then I'm going to go into city manager comments uh, to make a comment on item C2. Okay, all right, sending it right back to you, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Our first item today is public comment. Members of the public may hear, observe, and provide public comment virtually by registering through the following link, which can be found on reno.gov forward slash meetings, https colon forward slash forward slash l-i-n-k-s period r-e-n-o period g-o-v forward slash capital c-o-u-n-c-i-l zero three hyphen two seven. It should be noted for those in the audience that comments are to be addressed to the mayor and council as a whole. Comments heard under this item will be limited to three minutes per person and may pertain to matters both on and off the council's agenda. Council may not take action upon any matter not agendized on today's agenda. When you're called on for public comment, please state your name for the record and begin speaking. The timer will begin when you say your name and you will be afforded three minutes. For those participating in chambers in accordance with Council Rules 6.3.11, while in this room, please be respectful. Disruptive behavior from audience members like clapping, yelling, whistling, etc., which impede the meeting may result in a warning issued by the presiding officer. If this behavior continues, you may be removed from chambers. If you're an attendee in the Zoom meeting and would like to make public comment, please raise your hand at this time. Our first public commenter today is Jerry Mifsud, followed by Terry Brooks, followed by Cedric Garcia. All right, Jerry, come on up. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. <laughs> you have an escort. <clears throat> Can you, uh, Heighten. Just put it up there. We'll get it up for you. I think I know who that is. Hey, you know me <laughs> privately. Watch it. <laughs> Cute. Um, my mom liked curls in the hair. Then I became a hippie, and that was it for me. Mm. Uh, this doesn't start until I say my name, uh, Mickey. My name is Jerry Miff Sud. 
You rarely do you hear my last name. Can you say my last name, Miss Hillary? Fudd. Miss Miff Sud. Miss Sud. <laughs> oh boy, you're bad. You're bad. Your your last name is easy. So <clears throat> someone approached me a little few minutes earlier and said, please add a little kindness to your approach today. Well, <clears throat> I I wanted to talk about the city attorney. And there wasn't going to be any kindness there. But what's most important is I've seen your former city council meetings. And you need to give a sense of solidarity between you all. I know I saw one of your speeches to your council members, which sounded like uh, Rodney King, who said, why can't we all get along? And you gave one of those speeches. Why can't we at least say hello to one another when we're back there? And that only said that the continuity between you is not there. Um, you have a job as a leader to keep all the uh, different elements together so you work as a team. And I believe in you, kind of, sort of. Maybe it's the red lipstick and the blonde hair. I, I don't know, Mayor. <laughs> but, um, I remember one time when I met you in the alleyway here uh, behind City Hall. Remember that day? Do you remember that day when I ran up to you when you were in the alleyway and I go, Mayor, Mayor, and you said, uh, Mr. Senator, um, my main focus has been, and you've helped me, Hillary, with my fellow seniors. Look how many seniors are here today. Could all you seniors raise your hand? Now, that gray hair is giving you away. We are walking history. Without us seniors, none of you would be here. Yet we're pushed to the wayside. It's important that you think of your fellow seniors, support them in anything that they need, because we have particular needs. Um, me, I'm almost 80 years old, and I act like I'm 25. That's because my doctor gave me a particular prescription I can't talk about. <laughs> anyway, um, with all due respect to you, uh, Miguel, um, I'm not going to pick on the city attorney because he's not here today. I just want to say that this town needs affordable housing. It needs to address the homeless people. It needs to go after the meth problem. You got the Mexican cartel in this town. Just love each other and your neighbor, and we'll all get along. I won't hold back any applause. Thank you very much. Thank you, you, my like friend. That? Terry Brooks, followed by Cedric Garcia, followed by Bill Miller. Good morning. Nice Good to see morning. you, Terry. Good morning. It's me, Terry Brooks, again. And today I feel the responsibilities to address discrimination in employment when it comes to disabilities. If people quit discriminating, they might actually find that some jobs could be done a lot better if they're done by people who are blind. People who are blind and have lost their sense of sight have better senses of touch and hearing and can use them to do things right. And if employers quit discriminating against the deaf who cannot hear, they might learn that such employees will better likely persevere. Deaf people who cannot hear have a better sense of sight. So there are some jobs that they can do always right. And if employers decided to hire both the deaf and the blind, they can get a lot more done when all their skills are combined. And if employers quit discriminating against people with physical disabilities, they might begin to appreciate those people's capabilities. Those people may have lost the use of some parts of their bodies, but have learned to do such things with other parts of their bodies. And if employers quit discriminating against people with mental disabilities, they might begin to appreciate those people's capabilities. Those people may have less use of some parts of their minds, but have learned to do all kinds of things with other parts of their minds. And if employers decide to hire people with both physical and mental disabilities, 
They could all learn even more from each other and expand each other's capabilities. Some employers have learned to accommodate the disabled people as workers because they have learned that the disabled make very good workers. The more diversity that there is when it comes to occupation, the more everyone can learn from each other in such a situation. I would like to thank you all for listening to me today, and I look forward to coming back because I got a lot more to say. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, where are we at? Okay, this is chapter 27, just so you know. Okay. I've only got 19 more chapters to go. To go. <laughs> oh, and by the way, I've already started another book titled My Thoughts on Being a Senior. Love it. Because I'm a senior. <laughs> thank you so much, thank Terry. You. Great all job. <laughs> Um, Madam Clerk, I just want to, for the record, I believe uh, Councilwoman Dewar is on Zoom, correct? And then Councilwoman Ebert, is she on Zoom too? Nope, Councilmember Ebert is absent at this okay. time. Okay, all right, thanks so much. Welcome. Cedric Garcia, followed by Bill Miller, followed by Aspen Ney. Hello, how are you today? Hi, Frederick. My name is Marquis Cedric DeVoe, Gilmore Garcia, Brandon Ray's Life, and Kelly Dobbs. Cedric, Cedric, if you wouldn't mind going in front of the microphone and speaking into it, please. Better. Thank you. My full name is Marquis Cedric DeVoe, Gilmore Garcia, Brandon Ray's Life, and Pellage Dobbs. I'm the oldest of 28 kids. I speak three languages. Wow. Um, my mother left me on the side of the freeway when I was four years old. I was put in the adoption care system. My adopted family kicked me out when I was nine. I lived 16 years homeless on the streets mm -hmm. until I joined the military. I joined the military for seven years until I heard what was happening in Reno. Because of what was I heard, I stopped my military career and came out here to find out if what I was hearing was true. I've now lived here homeless, like I always do, for an entire year. I've now seen all sides of any type of police interaction. I've talked to multiple council members, not council members, I apologize, multiple uh, district attorneys, multiple offices know me at, at alternate public defenders office until Mark Picker left. It, it, I was really upset by how things, how I perceived things. I moved out here in 2016. Originally, before I joined the military, I met my mother for the first time. Wow. When I moved out here in 2017, I came out here tra trying to figure out why this type of injustice is allowed in a city so, so predominant with the Washoe tribe, Native Americans of fourth generation Chicano. I, I'm ashamed so badly that I'm not going back into the military. I, I was gonna give 25 years of my life to the military, but because of the way this city is acting, all the way from the district attorney, even Chief Nancy, when Chief Soto left, I came up here and spoke last time when Chief Nancy was here. Half of you guys decided to walk in the back door and pretend I didn't exist. I've already spoken here before. I was treated with no regard. That's fine. I'm gonna leave this city. This is my last weekend here. I'm gonna go on to my next city and go on to my next thing. But because of the actions, that this city chooses to wipe off is just another problem. The homeless, the police, the this, the that. Because of all the problems that you guys are whisking away is nothing. That's why I choose not to serve anymore. And this is not the America I fought for. I'm sad. So hopefully I can find my own happiness in my own way. That's all I have. Thank you, have a good day. Thank you so much. Bill Miller, followed by Aspen Nay, followed by Noah Bristol. Good morning, Mayor Sheevy, council members, staff, and fellow citizens. I'm Bill Miller, climateer and constituent here representing the climate of our fair city. First, as always, I want to acknowledge this council for its forward thinking actions to mitigate the relentless challenges of our human-caused climate crisis. You have acted to reduce emissions, increase solar, transform our vehicle fleet with EVs, wisely invest federal dollars, and on and on. So thanks for that. Today you have three items relating to Reno's relationship with NV Energy. <clears throat> D2 and D3 are fairly perfunctory renewals. D4 gets more to the heart of the matter. A shared vision toward further reducing emissions, increasing renewables, increasing reliability, 
while keeping programs fair and equitable. This is a heavy lift under any circumstance, but one made more complicated by the reality that NV Energy is beholden to Wall Street and council members are beholden to Reno residents. These two entities could hardly be more different, yet must find common ground to move forward. One thing both share in common is everyone loses if we don't seriously address the escalating climate crisis. There will be no profits and no governance if our underlying support systems collapse. This is not hyperbole. According to the Wall Street Journal, climate change has already cost the U.S. economy 150 billion, with a B, dollars, and that cost is rising every year as this crisis continues to drift from bad to worse. So I implore you, please come together and find workable solutions, not just promises and pledges, actual solutions to turn the corner on this crisis. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much. Aspen Nay, followed by Noah Bristol, followed by Christian Reese. And if we could hold the applause, please. Good morning, Madam Mayor and Council Members. My name is Aspen Nay for the record, but I go by Alex. I'm a senior in the Medical Academy at AACT, and the upcoming elections will be my first time voting. I'm here today to provide you with my experience with the U City Council and to assure this is documented in the public record. I have submitted attachments to the clerk. I applied online for YCC in December 7th, 2020 during my freshman year. Where, where is On February 25th, 2021, I wrote an email to Councilman Reese, who was the YCC liaison, to inquire about the status of my application. Mr. Reese responded that the YCC was not, had not met for a year, but told me to submit a letter of interest and he would see if we can get moving. In June, I updated my information yet again because I was now a sophomore. I again emailed Councilman Reese, who also connected me to Kathy Kelly Ballinger, who said she would start working on the YCC applications. On August 27th, 2021, I again emailed Kathy and Reese to inquire about the status. On August 30th, Kathy responded that a new employee would be starting on the 31st and would be working on getting YCC up and running again. She stated, we will be in touch soon, I promise. Kathy emailed me on September 13th to, to let me know that Brian Andre would be in touch. I'm not sure of the date, but Brendan did reach out to me, excuse me, Brendan Andre, and we did have a phone interview for a YCC position. On November 22nd, I again reached out to Brendan and Mr. Reese following up on the status of my application. Brendan responded to me the next day to say he only had three members, including myself, and needed to have nine. He stated he needed help with recruiting and would look to get this up and running after Thanksgiving. I reached out again on December 1st, requesting flyers to distribute. In February, I reached out to Brendan and expressed my frustration that this process had taken so long and nothing was happening. I expressed that it felt like the city didn't really care about the youth. On February 16th, 2022, I received an astonishingly disrespectful, unprofessional, and frankly horrific email from a city employee to a 15-year-old high school sophomore. I cc'd both Mr. Reese and Mayor Sheevy on this email thread, but no one reached out to even apologize for the staff member's behavior. I see that the YCC is up and running in 2024. I am now a senior set to graduate in June, and I have spent the entirety of my time in high school waiting for the city of Reno and Mr. Reese to do the right thing for youth in the community, rather than lying and passing the matter over to staff members who insult teenagers. This has set a bad precedent for me and any other youth looking to be involved in this community. I hope to see my representatives do a better job for all community members in the future. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. First of all, I'm not sure who Brendan is. Um, I did not receive your letter, so I want you to know that. I believe Nathan Ilya, Nathan? Yes, if we can have please, Director Ilya. Because I think you are the one that's in charge of YCC, correct? Okay, thank you so much. I'm gonna have Nathan meet with you right now. By the way, future mayor, good job. Getting up here is hard to come and speak in front of everyone. It's intimidating and you're nervous. I mean, public speaking is like, uh, what's the top three? 
public speaking, flying. flying, and the dentist. I hate all three. So good job. All right. I know you. Noah Bristol, followed by you? Christian Reese, followed by Barry Levinson via Zoom. All right, go ahead. Uh, I, before I start, I need the use of the this deal, the projector. Go ahead. I think you can put it there, and then it should pop up. Yeah. Let's go like this. Do a reveal. Okay. Get my comments. Good morning, Mayor Shivi, Council. Uh, my name is Noah Bristol. I'm an artist living here in downtown Reno, and I choose not to own a car, so I had a lovely walk along the river this morning to get here. My comments pertain to item C2. The Planning Commission has made a number of proposed changes to Reno's Land Development Code. To be clear, I am a fan of cutting red tape and streamlining the process for building more housing. And I love that we're having conversations about things like accessory dwelling units, affordable housing, and missing middle housing, allowing duplexes, triplexes, and fourplexes in more places in Reno. These are big steps in the right direction. But one of the Planning Commission's recommendations is to allow affordable housing by right. Affordable housing is great, but they propose um, to do this by allowing proposed affordable housing developments to skip any kind of entitlement review. And um, I'm suggesting that skipping that review process is a mistake. I'm gonna quote a couple paragraphs from Alicia Barber's recent writing, because I frequently use it as a jumping in point. She says, affordable housing projects or missing middle projects or high density projects are not inherently better designed than any other projects. They aren't automatically more responsive to their immediate contexts, so why should we act as though they are? The Planning Commission provides an invaluable forum, not just for allowing the public to speak about proposed projects, but ensuring that a project is more responsive to its context, something that a builder and developer may not fully comprehend, much less design for, uh, end of quote. Uh, so that review process is crucial. It allows us not just to build a lot of housing, but to build housing that's actually worth living in. Housing that actually responds to the needs of the people it is designed and built for. It's the difference between building lots of boxes that just store bodies and material belongings versus building housing in neighborhoods that also encourage the flourishing of the human spirit. We want to build places that are truly, deeply alive. Uh, here is a typical suburban neighborhood. I don't know where it is, and it doesn't matter, it could be anywhere, they all look the same. Uh, now here is a neighborhood in Charleston, South Carolina. This is called Ion. And um, I mean, which place would you rather live in, right? I mean, I know some people wanna live here and I don't wanna shame anybody for wanting to live there, that's fine. But like, I know I wanna live in the other kind of neighborhood. Um, and it's interesting to note that both neighborhoods shown are zoned for the same thing, single family residential, but they have radically different character. The character of the former example is that it has none. Um, building desirable places, or at least it has none of its own. Building desirable places for people to live in isn't just a matter of aesthetics, it's also a matter of economics. Even though we're talking about affordable housing, if you design for the needs of the community in a way that's aesthetically and functionally pleasing, that's really alive, you'll make the property value in those places around the affordable housing go up, which means more tax revenue for the city to administer all the things we wanna do in our wonderful city. And by getting rid of the planning review process, we're reducing our ability to create such living places, and we're leaving a lot of tax revenue on the table too. It is for this reason that I urge the council to please keep the planning review process in place. Thank you again for all of your time. Thank you so much, Noah. Christian Reese, followed by Barry Levinson via Zoom, followed by Tracy Wilson. Hello, uh, my name is Christian Gregory Reese, and thank you for allowing us to attend and comment in today's meeting. I am the Nevada Regional Manager for World Mobile. We are a new telecommunications network who are building a new way of providing connectivity through home and business internet with cellular access on blockchain, new technologies, and a new business model, the sharing economy. Half of the world is still offline. That's over three billion people. And here in the United States, even in the 21st century, 22% of Americans in rural areas lack coverage from fixed terrestrial broadband. And 27% of Native Americans living on reservation lands lack coverage from fixed terrestrial broadband. Overall, 24 million people in the US still live in digital deserts without internet connectivity. To us, this is simply unacceptable here and around the world. The major carriers have left half of the world offline. 
these figures, alongside obtaining license spectrum from the FCC to operate as a carrier in Nevada, California, Utah, and New Mexico to start prove to us why coming to the US is aligned with our mission. So what did we do to connect the unconnected? We went to the deepest parts of the island of Zanzibar off the coast of East Africa to test our new way of providing connectivity alongside Mozambique, Kenya, and Tanzania. As our first proof of concepts, we brought internet access and solar to the most remote villages we could find, to people who have never been on the internet before. From our aerial-based platform capable of radio payloads to our rooftop infrastructure, our distributed and decentralized approach allows hosts and operators to own the network and partake in the revenue generated by it. And for the first time ever, allow cities and communities around the world to bring connection to themselves, to their neighbors, all without waiting for boardrooms to weigh whether or not their connection and voice makes financial sense to them. A network owned by and for the people that doesn't own, track, or sell your data, all settled and secured by the blockchain. Now you're probably wondering, sounds great, but why Reno? We are connected, why is this needed? Well, even in established cities around the world, 150 million people still lack quality and affordable internet access. And alongside being a great city and state to do business, one I was born and raised in, Nevada has the worst coverage availability in the nation. And to test this, we installed an antenna in the heart of downtown Reno, and over 24 hours, we received over 10,000 attachment requests from user devices. These requests mean the user is not getting enough service or getting nothing at all from their existing carriers. One area, one antenna, 10,000 people in our city looking for an alternative. As we prepare to launch our cellular network with Reno being the first operational city in the country in the coming weeks, we've just launched our home and business internet offering. We're eager and very much looking forward to working with our city officials, our partners, and our wonderful community here in Reno Tahoe. Thank you. All right, and tell people how they can get in touch with you. Um, you can uh, reach out to us on worldmobile.io as well as uh, broadband.worldmobile.us. All right, good Thank job. You. Good job. Thank you. Barry Levinson via Zoom, followed by Tracy Wilson, followed by Kayla O'Dell. Barry, if you would unmute and state your name for the record. Sorry about that. Thank okay, you. yes. So, um, yes, good morning, Mayor Sheevy, Vice Mayor Doerr, and Council members. My name is Barry Levinson, and I am a member of the Sierra Club Great Basin Group. My comments today are regarding item D4, the Energy Partnership Agreement between City of Reno and MV Energy, and C2, the Affordable Housing Amendments to Title 18. Um, Sierra Club is in full support of the Energy Partnership Agreement, and we would like to commend our sustainability manager, Suzanne Groenman, on this excellent agreement. We are thrilled to see that Reno and Envy Energy are partnering to reduce energy use and greenhouse gas emissions in Reno while improving reliability, resilience, and equity associated with the electricity grid. We're especially excited to see the goal to expand community-based renewable energy and hope that this means many more community solar projects like the one at the Moana Pool. We are also excited to see the expedited conversion of streetlights to LEDs, accelerated development of EV infrastructure, collaboration of energy benchmarking for buildings, conversion of older electrical infrastructure to improve reliability, and the agreement to seek equitable solutions in moving forward with these projects. Again, Sierra Club is in full support, support of this energy partnership agreement and hope that it will help move our city forward to a more sustainable future. Regarding the amendment to Title 18 addressing affordable housing, Sierra Club is all in favor of increasing affordable housing, especially if it can avoid further sprawl by using infill on prior developed land. Sierra Club does encourage that all new housing, especially affordable housing, be equipped with solar panels. We feel that the affordability of housing needs to take into account long-term costs, including costs of utilities. If the new housing came with solar panels already installed, this would eliminate much of the unit's electricity bill, which really adds up over time, making the housing that much more affordable. We would also like to encourage the use of electrical appliances 
rather than using gas in any new housing. Gas stoves do not burn clean, as we have been led to believe by the gas companies. Instead, they emit a number of harmful chemicals that can cause asthma, cancer, and heart disease. This can only be mitigated by use of an overhead fan that exhausts to the outside, which is often lacking in affordable housing. We would also encourage the use of heat pumps, which are much more energy efficient than gas furnaces and use no fossil fuels. So in summary, Sierra Club supports the affordable housing amendments to Title 18 and would strongly encourage that these units be built with solar panels and electrical appliances. Thank you for your time this morning and all that you do for our city. Kayla O'Dell, followed by J.D. Klippenstein, followed by Tracy Wilson. Sorry, my order got messed up. Sorry, Tracy. Go ahead. Good morning, Madam Mayor and Council Members. My name is Tracy Wilson, and I am the Nevada State Director for American Wild Horse Conservation and a volunteer liaison with Wild Horse Connection. Um, First, I'm here to thank the city of Reno for stepping up to work on the issues as development has pushed into the urban rangeland interface um, in southeast Reno, pushing development further up the hills. New development conditions on fencing, cattle guards, and gates have been incredibly helpful um, as new plan development comes forward, and it's going to resolve a lot of issues that we've dealt with in the past. I'd also like to thank Vice Mayor Dewar for her continued work to make Southeast Reno safe for both community members and the historic Virginia Range horses that roam the hills and call those hills home. From speed limits, signage, to public awareness, to a full fencing plan that will fix the problem of horses on the streets once and for all. And that brings me to my ask. I'm asking, begging if you will, um, that the city consider allocating ARPA and or budget funding to complete the south piece of this fencing plan. This is a critical need in the city and we are so very close to solving this problem. It would be a sh truly shining moment for Reno to see this through to the end and all the problems that we have heard continuously reduced to near zero. Um, so I'm just asking you to, to consider that as you consider the budget funding and thank you for your time today. Right. Thanks, Tracy. Kayla O'Dell, followed by J.D. Klippenstein, followed by Susan Whitenack via Zoom. I'm out of order, my bad. Hi, my name is Kayla, and I am here today to urge you to use your humanity and to pass a resolution to end the siege of Palestine. $3,925,859 of our yearly minimum, $3.8 billion, is sent to the Israeli occupation from Reno taxpayers. Considering Washoe County is the third least affordable county in the U.S., we have many issues in our community that we must address and help rather than using our hard-earned tax dollars to fund genocide. I suggest using these tax dollars to fund more affordable housing, health care, education within our city, and better support for our homeless community members rather than criminalize them. I and many others do not agree with our money being sent, spent on an illegal occupation actively committing genocide, which has resulted in over 13,000 children killed by the Israeli occupation forces. One in three children under two years of age suffer from malnutrition due to the blockade of aid also by the IOF. Quite literally, we have been begging for months to stop killing children. It's such an absurd statement to say. I wanted to end this with a quote from James Baldwin that states, the children are always ours, every single one of them all over the globe, and I am beginning to suspect that whoever is in, in, incapable of recognizing this may be incapable of morality. I urge you again to pass a resolution to end the siege of Palestine. Thank you. J.D. Klippenstein, followed by Susan Whitenack via Zoom, followed by Vera M. Uh, good morning, Madam Mayor, uh, Council Members. My name is J.D. Klippenstein. I am the Director of Development for the Reno Housing Authority. And I'm here this morning to speak in support of the affordable housing incentives that are being brought before you in agenda item C2. Um, as you may know, the Housing Authority's doubled down on our efforts to preserve and develop more affordable housing 
We have currently two projects under construction and another five that will break ground before the end of the year. Uh, and if I've learned anything as we've tried to get those projects across the finish line is just how important every single tool in the affordable housing toolbox is. And I think that's what's being brought before you in item C2. Um, they're not silver bullets to our housing crisis, but they are tools that will help. I think expedited uh, building permit process, exemption from entitlement review, and in particular the density bonuses available to affordable housing are going to be very helpful. And I know in, for a fact they will help current projects we have and future projects that we have in our pipeline. Um, I do want to address this concern around the folks may have around the exemption for uh, entitlement review for affordable housing. I actually think it's a really forward-thinking way to address one of the biggest challenges we have, which is nimbyism. I think not in my backyard attitudes are a barrier to developing more affordable housing in a variety of communities in our neighborhood. And uh, it makes it more expensive and sometimes it just outright kills projects. And being able to develop affordable housing by right addresses that. It gets more projects into the pipeline. And I'd also like to add, this is particularly true for affordable housing built for households at or below 60% AMI. Those projects, in order to be financed, have to go through state, local, and federal funding sources, all of which have very, very high standards for construction, all of which have annual monitoring. So I think there, there may be concerns around the quality of housing. Um, I, I think that those concerns are not well placed when it comes to deeply affordable housing. The nature of developing that kind of affordable housing lends to uh, a lot of public scrutiny just to get the financing in place. And I would have very little concern about the quality of housing being developed for households at or below that income level. Um, so overall, I would encourage the council um, to move forward on, the, on this initiative. I'm really thankful for the staff that have done the research and brought it forward. I think it's a good idea. Thank you. Thanks, JD. Susan Whitenack via Zoom, followed by Vera M, followed by Jeffrey Lofton. Susan, please unmute, state your name for the record, and begin speaking. Good morning. My name is Susan Whitenack, and I am a long-term Reno resident. I am here today to voice concerns about the growing number of short-term rentals within the city of Reno and to comment after reviewing the results of the STR survey. STRs near schools raise safety concerns. Background checks are often lacking. And I am requesting today that the city council consider prohibiting STRs within a thousand feet of any school to protect the students that attend these schools. The thousand feet distance is also the regulation for tier, excuse me, for tier three offenders to not live within a location primarily used by children. I thank you for your consideration. Vera M followed by Jeffrey Lofton. I'm short, sorry. Uh, my name is Vera, um, and as y'all have said, it is very nerve-wracking to come up here and speak, so I'm going to read off of something that I wrote. Um, I speak to council today to urge you to agendize two items, um, and end, uh, a resolution to end the siege, uh, a step beyond a ceasefire. Many, um, many cities have already, hundreds of cities have already passed a ceasefire resolution, and um, and also to create a warming center for Reno. For Reno. Um, council, I want to speak to a knowledge gap. Perhaps you do not understand the situation on the ground. Um, I offer to the archive an abridged version of Let's Talk Palestine, which is a daily update service for many, many things that are happening on the ground daily. Um, last Monday on Mar March 18th, 10 days ago, Israel occupation forces stormed Al Shifa Hospital again. Um, sorry. Again. This was day 164 of the genocide. 81 Palestinians were killed, 116 injured. 
Day 165, 93 Palestinians killed, 142 Palestinians injured. Day 166, 104 Palestinians were killed, 162 injured. Day 167, 65 Palestinians were killed, 92 were injured. Day 168, the siege of the uh, the hospital enters its fifth day. Gaza death toll surpasses 32,000 people, not including the thousands buried under the rubble. Day 169, eyewitness Jamila al Hisa, who escaped the besieged El Shifa hospital, recounts Israeli soldiers raping, torturing, and executing women in the hospital. Um, Israel executed on this day Dr. Muhammad Al Nono. Um, I believe he was around 60 years old when he refused to abandon his patients. On this day, 72 Palestinians were killed, 114 injured. Day 170 of the genocide, 84 Palestinians were killed, 106 injured. Day 171, 107 Palestinians were killed, 176 injured. On day 172, 81 Palestinians were killed, 93 were injured. And when we talk about injured, this is loss of limb, this is bullet wounds, this is um, a strap metal that cakes your face and hurts your bones. Um, yeah, I urge you to please consider to agendize these two important items, and I hope you hear me today. Jeffrey Lofton. Uh, Jeffrey Lofton, uh, broker, salesperson, property manager uh, with Dixon Realty. And we also do uh, some student housing and some senior housing and have used the density bonus available in code uh, to create some, uh, most recently, some veteran housing. So I wanted to try to quickly distill the thoughts I've been having. Um, and the, the first is that I'm, I'm very grateful to see, you know, an artist and an affordable housing person and impassioned members of the community coming up and sharing their ideas to build the community. It occurs to me that the work that you do as council is very difficult. And so I wanted to share, again, my gratitude for staff as I have a large number of interactions with staff in my capacity of uh, working on zoning changes that we've brought before you, or uh, supporting uh, measures for affordable housing, or I've had, as I've had opportunities to re, uh, meet recently or, or speak recently with Mr. Martinez as we did a, uh, that, that student housing or that, uh, that VA housing project in his neighborhood. Um, the community is interested and they're involved and they're working. And so I wanted to say, um, just kind of recount my experience going through with the project and the people involved and how the staff has made those things possible. And I want to do that because I, I recognize that by the time a measure gets to you, um, in that moment and the way the decision is being made here in council, you guys have, have already thought about and worked on and, and read the language and thought about other things we may not have considered that are in the language. But I'm of the mind that because we have the staff that is working so hard and interacting with the public and so many countless interactions, uh, we should use and be grateful for the versions of the code changes, the versions of affordable housing initiatives that they bring forward, and that we should be kind and permissive of, of trying their resolutions and their, uh, their language in, in practice. So, uh, when you go to bring, uh, we've seen a dramatic improvement in the speed of permits coming back. We're grateful for that. Uh, we really are getting responses within 10 days when we put permits in, and that's huge. Um, we're seeing, you know, from the beginning of the process, we have an opportunity to meet with, uh, with planning, with engineering, with public works, and, uh, and having those conversation early, conversations early creates higher quality projects. Um, so uh, as that flows through, we, we are able to, short time. We're able to, uh, to see staff making good decisions, enforcing code in a way that's, that's important and useful. And I want to speak in favor of uh, streamlining the process, 
um, of approving affordable housing. I want to speak in favor of um, ADUs. These are self-regulating things. They're also regulated in code. We need opportunities for, for ADUs. Uh, and in favor of density bonuses. If any of you would like to talk, uh, I, I still have a, a meeting on the books with, with uh, Councilman Reese. I can show you examples of how these things are working and how um, what exists in code and the things we're adding to and revising in code are making these projects more affordable and, and creating an environment of housing availability, which will lead to affordability. Thank you. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And the kind words about our staff. Thank you. Madam Mayor, with that, we have no additional in-person public comments. For the records, we did receive 21 comments, which were general in nature, or not directly associated with an agenda item prior to 4 p.m. yesterday, March 26th. These comments were voicemail and or written correspondence received via our reno.gov online public comment form or by email to our office. Copies of these have been distributed to the Reno City Council and are available to the public on reno.gov forward slash meetings. 13 letters in favor and eight letters of concern. And with that, we have no additional public comment. We're looking to move on to item A4, approval of the agenda with the changes from Assistant City Manager Turney. All right, thank you. I'm gonna send it over to Assistant City Manager Turney. Go thank ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council today. Uh, we are recommending, I will be pulling item C2 from this agenda. There was a significant deviation from staff's recommendation to the Planning Commission recommendation. Uh, we will be directing staff to go and have additional workshop and engagement interactions with the public so they're able to weigh in before that comes back before this body. So again, item C2 will be removed from this agenda. We will be re-noticing, and that will come back at a future time after additional workshop and public engagement. Additionally, Madam Mayor and Council, we will be removing items D2, D3, and D4. Again, items Delta 2, Delta 3, Delta 4 from this agenda. This is a request from NV Energy. This will be coming back on the April 10th agenda for this body. With that, Madam Mayor, I have no further changes to this agenda. I would also like to note that this body will break for an attorney-client meeting during lunch for labor updates. And additionally, we do have a 6 p.m. hearing tonight. Okay. Thank With that, you Madam so Mayor, no further changes. All right. Thank you so much. All right. At this time, I'm going Madam to ask... Mayor. Go right ahead. Okay, I want to comment on that. Number one, I think it was fully contemplated with the Planning Commission that there were deviations from staff recommendations. Staff recommendation is not a, a Bible written in stone. It's fully anticipated that the Planning Commission can look at different and wanted, when you read the minutes, to bring this booted up to the council with how it went. So we see this time and time again, and I think the front end is getting to the Planning Commission from the process of the staff. You know, So I, I, um, I really am troubled by that. But the most important thing I want to speak about is the franchise agreements. Those are agreements that are the most important fiscal decisions that the council ever makes. They reach, it wasn't in the staff report, it sh probably should have been, Billions of dollars over the life of those agreements impacting our residents. It's something that I've looked forward to for a decade. One of the first things I looked at when I sat this body in 2012 was when do those agreements come on and will I have a piece of those in that decide? I, I've had dozens of conversations with people about opportunities to fine tune those agreements. I can point to policy suggestions in our sustainability plan and our master plan to take these agreements into the 21st century with our specific municipal powers that work in tandem with those of the state of Nevada. So you can imagine my surprise when I saw cooked red line agreements ready for our adoption without any public input on how we are going to do these franchise agreements. It reflects a transactional nature of our city manager, how he is administering the city, and it's a missed opportunity in many ways. So I hope it doesn't come to the April 10th agreement. I hope we have a workshop, we have a briefing here on what is a franchise agreement, how they work. I worked on a franchise agreement 30 years ago, and I learned one thing, is the franchisees they negotiate with cities and local governments all day long, all over. Cities get one chance, maybe 15 years, yeah. you know, like we are. And the first thing you do is you hire a consultant to let you know the parameters within your law, within the purviews of how this franchisees have worked to bring, to advance your policy goals in your franchise agreements. 
None of that is being done right now. It's a missed opportunity, if I may, for the Ward 1 people who have suffered from Nevada Energy failures of line management through two fires since I've been on the council. I had specific reporting requirements that I wanted in there from NV Energy, to never provided the opportunity to give any input on that, never briefed by staff on that. That is very troubling. Also, there's a whole lot of reporting that we were gonna do in our sustainability plan. None of that is in there. That is a transactional document favoring NV Energy with the NRD public purview, and it is the most important decision we will make. All right, uh, in I'm years. gonna cut you off at your three minutes. Councilman, or Councilwoman Dewar, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Um, I do support this being pulled, uh, perhaps for different reasons than Council Member Breakfast, and some are the same. The reasons that are the same are that I think um, this is a very, I agree that it's a very important document. And I'm not prepared myself to approve a red line today, just as she is not. And I do think it needs a workshop at the council so that the public and the council can debate and discuss what are the, the contours and parameters of the agreement. And we may want to look at that partnership agreement and see what portions of it can be put into the actual franchise agreement. So some may be transferable, may, some may be standing alone. So I appreciate the opportunity for further discussion on this. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much. ACM, attorney. Madam Mayor, thank you. We have that feedback from council. And at this time, we are pulling them from this agenda with approval of this body. All right. Okay. I have, a, I have a motion. I have a second. I'm not supporting, um, while I do appreciate the D items moving, and I will be looking for a consultant to look after our interest in negotiation, because that's what a municipality would be neglectful if they do not have someone on their side helping this with this very specific area of expertise and importance. But I'm not gonna support, because I think the C2 item needs to go forward. I, I don't know how I feel about it, but I, I feel that it's not respectful to our process, the planning commission work to say, oh, the planning commission wants to send something to you, but we want more workshops on it. No, the planning commission spent a lot of time, there's seven members we all appoint, in trusting their views, we should not have our fingers on it and then let staff manage it on to workshops. That's just not the way it should go. So I think we should hear DC2 today as anticipated by the planning commission and give guidance on that. And so I won't support pulling it and not and not having it come back in the form that it exists right now without um, you know discussion by us. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Motion carries. Okay, Madam Clerk. Madam Mayor. Yes, go ahead. Uh, to the last point, and I didn't get to make this point, I really do think it would be valuable to have um, council input into C2, into the um, discussion of the affordable workshop. And I guess I'm wondering how that does happen. Do we, um, I would at least like to get notice of any workshops that our staff holds. And I think the planning commission would probably appreciate that too. So that at least we know that the workshops are happening and what's agendized so that we're, we can stay abreast of this issue. Yes, thank you so much. Thanks. And I just, I, I don't, I'd like to also understand how much outreach was done. Um, and then I think you brought up a good point, and I don't remember when that was, Councilwoman Dewar, but parceling out some of these versus affordable versus regular housing. Um, so I, I just think that at this time, I, I just don't know how much was done because I received a lot of public uh, input on this item. Madam Mayor. Well, Madam Mayor, to that point, if I could, it would be helpful for us in order to be able to focus on the affordable housing piece if, if as we requested previously, those could be broken out from ones that are just designed to maybe increase density or increase housing generally mm -hmm. so that we can focus on affordable housing, what we're doing for that, um, and that was a specific request from the legislature versus what's being done generally to support housing. Mm -hmm. So that would, I, to your point, thank you. Yeah. you. And the ADU piece we've been talking about for a long time, so I'd like to get that back as soon as possible. So but, Madam ahead. Mayor, if I can step ACM. in to help guide a little bit. Uh, one thing, as you mentioned, I'll go in reverse order. ADUs will be, they are on this agenda today. 
That is item D1, and that will be presented by staff. That is a follow-up from what the public input process was. That is not an ordinance introduction today. Just okay, good. I'm sorry. I thought that was included in here. That's, that's all right. And Perfect. then as it relates to feedback received from this council, I believe that there were three workshops that were done before we went to planning commission. However, uh, Vice Mayor Dewar, your feedback is understood, and we will make sure that council and planning commission is the rest of the upcoming engagement opportunities. With that, Madam Mayor, okay. I think you're set, and you can move on to item A5 for approval of your minutes. All right, thank you so much. Uh, may I get a motion for approval of minutes? So moved. I have second. a motion, I have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. All right, at this time, we're gonna head into the consent agenda, and I'm gonna start with Councilman Reese. Uh, nothing, Madam Mayor. Perfect. Councilwoman Ebert. Uh, yeah, I'd like to pull items B13, B14, and B15, please. 13, 14, 15? Correct? Yes, please. All right. Uh, Councilwoman Taylor. Nothing, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Councilman Martinez. Do those together and I was going to do B15 so I'll make some comments at that point. Okay perfect thank you so much. Councilwoman Breckus. Nothing. All right with that being said may I get a motion? Madam Mayor. To yes oh sorry. Yeah okay. I wanted to pull item B7, B9, and B10. All right though nine and ten have already been pulled so B7. Okay. Yeah. All right with that thank being you. said may I get a motion to approve all consent agenda items besides the ones that were pulled. So moved. All right, I have a motion. Second. I have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those aye. opposed? Motion carries. All right, we're going to head into item B7, Councilwoman Dewar. Yes, Madam Mayor. Um, I just wondered if we could have a very brief presentation. Uh, this is over $3 million, almost $3.5 million of expenditures uh, that the public will benefit from directly. So I could, I just wondered if staff could identify those projects for us. Okay. Hi, yes. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of the council, uh, Hans Meyer, senior civil engineer, uh, here before you today pre to present on this item for uh, the 2024 preventative maintenance project. Um, additionally, just for clarification, B8 um, is a related construction inspection services program for this contract. Um, really briefly, uh, just the alignment with the strategic plan. Um, here are the two items that it most aligns with in front of you. Uh, just what is this project? Um, on the right side, you will see uh, what is typically of this project. It is a slurry seal um, program throughout uh, our neighborhood streets. Uh, I like to colloquially call this a, our annual oil change. Um, basically, on the right-hand side, you'll see uh, an emulsified oil and fine rock applied to our roads to uh, continue the life of our roads throughout, throughout town. Um, on the left-hand side is where we will be focused on. Uh, this project is a part of our neighborhood street program. Uh, Within that program, we divide the city into three different triads. Uh, within this year, we are looking at the Northwest Verde Instead area. Um, throughout this program, or throughout this project, we're looking at tackling over about 43 miles of road, uh, consisting with 142 uh, streets that will receive patching, and um, about one mile of mill and overlay uh, throughout, the, throughout the town. Uh, just uh, some more details on it. Here's kind of a, just a brief before and after of what this project does to our neighborhood streets. Uh, the after on the right-hand side, uh, you'll notice is missing striping. Uh, this was just prior to that. Uh, at the end of the day, roads will be restriped, resurfaced, and uh, ready to be driven on and used for a many number of years. Um, with that, here's the kind of the project schedule of where we are and where we came from. Um, advertised the project in early February. And before you today, council approval. Construction would begin um, as early as spring, probably April or May of this year, and finish up in the summer uh, towards July or August. Uh, with that, recommended motion is there before you. Uh, move to award the contract 
for the 2024 preventive maintenance project to Sierra Nevada construction uh, in an amount not to exceed $3,471,007. That, that was so helpful. Thank you. I don't know if any council members have questions. Otherwise, I'll move for approval. Doesn't look well, like hearing it. none. Go ahead. Doesn't look like it, Vice Mayor Dewar. Thank you. Okay. Uh, well, I make a motion to approve item B7. Okay. I have a motion and a second by Ms. Taylor. Any additional questions? Hearing none, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Items B9 and B10 as pulled by Councilmember Martinez. Thank you so much. Similar style to the last item. Just wanted to get an overview and make sure the public is aware of the work that we're doing in these items. Of course, thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Vice Mayor and Council Members. Uh, Katie Harrison, Engineering Manager with the Public Works Department. And I have a brief presentation um, for B9, B10, and the Associated Con um, Construction Management Agreement B11. These projects are in alignment with the strategic plan uh, goal of infrastructure, climate change, and environmental sustainability. And as Hans mentioned in the previous presentation, um, the city is divided into three pavement management areas, and we rotate through these areas on a three-year cycle for our pavement inspection, preventative maintenance, and reconstruction projects. In 2024, we are in the northeast and southeast areas of Reno, and council confirmed these streets for reconstruction back in 2022. And we bring these recommended candidates to council for confirmation several years in advance of the actual construction to allow property owners and other utilities time for any necessary work in advance of the street project. Also, this project is included in the fiscal year 24 CIP budget. And so the right side of the screen shows the location of our two 2024 neighborhood street rehab projects, Yori North and Yori South. Yori North is located in Ward 3 and includes Yori Avenue from Mill Street to Bresson. And Yori South is located in Ward 1 and includes Yori from Plum to Gentry and several surrounding local streets, including Stoddard, Flag, Hubbard, and Galloway. So the map on the left side of the screen here shows a zoomed in area for this project, for the Yori North project. And this project will be an over $3 million investment in the community. Work will include replacement of over a half a mile of roadway and over a mile of sidewalk, which includes all new ADA ramps and improved pedestrian connectivity. The photo on the upper right shows an existing driveway in this neighborhood that is in poor condition and not ADA compliant. And the lower photo shows a driveway from a recently completed street rehab project. And this slide shows our Yori South neighborhood project. And this project will be an over five and a half million dollar investment in the community and includes replacement of over a mile of roadway, two miles of sidewalk and driveway replacements, along with pedestrian connectivity improvements and 26 ramp replacements to meet ADA requirements. The upper photo shows a location from this project where there is currently not a pedestrian ramp for accessibility. And the photo below shows an ADA ramp from a recent street project. And here's our project schedule. Again, council confirmed these streets for rehab back in March of 22. Project notifications were mailed out to the neighborhood in advance of advertising the project for bid on February 1st. These alert the neighborhood to the upcoming project and also allow them to complete any needed work in advance. We held a public meeting on February 13th to address any neighborhood questions or concerns. I also wanted to note that we have had extensive coordination with Washoe County School District since these two projects are adjacent to three separate schools. Next, we opened bids on February 22nd. Sierra Nevada Construction was the lowest responsive bidder for Yori North, and Spanish Springs Construction was the lowest responsive bidder for Yori South. And both of these contractors have successfully completed these types of projects in the past. <laughs> If council awards these projects today, construction will begin in the spring and wrap up in the fall. And during construction, the contractor is responsible for hand delivering notifications to residents regarding driveway closures, road work, et cetera. And city staff does track that those notifications are occurring. And with that, here are the recommended motions and I am available for any questions. Thank you all so much for the work and the outreach that has happened and also including some pedestrian 
improvements along with taking care of our streets. I know uh, the neighbors in that neighborhood are going to be very happy to see all of those improvements um, and when that comes about. So I just appreciate all the work and really highlighting the $9 million that are getting invested in this neighborhood, um, which sometimes has been overseen, but look, we are we have a close eye on that and we're investing in the neighborhoods that need the work done. So thank you and your staff for completing the work. Thank you. Councilmember Martinez, do you have a motion? I don't know if Councilmember Dewar had any comments. I don't believe so. On this, okay, yeah. Then. Yes, oh. I do. Councilmember Dewar. Yes, thank you. Um, my question for the staff, and I've brought this up before, First question is, are there, um, are we only doing road and sidewalk? Or are we, did you mention excavating for any pipes, sewer or water? With this project, there will be um, some minor sewer work completed. The majority of the sewer work has already been completed with previous projects. And we will be doing some upgrades to storm drain catch basins, so minor utility work. But we do coordinate with other utility um, agencies in advance. So right now, Tumwa is out there doing some water replacements as well, so that once we get the road paved, there will hopefully be not, no need to cut back into it. Okay. Well, one of my goals, and um, it's really relevant to the franchise agreements that were on before, was how do we get um, lines undergrounded when we're doing these massive projects uh, as another utility? So what I'd like to see is additional coordination. And that was something I was going to discuss um, in the franchise agreement is how do we ensure that that coordination takes place on both sides, not just from the city, but from MV Energy as well. I know they have an interest in undergrounding to protect from um, out, outages, blown down lines, just for a safety perspective. And my question, I guess, I don't even know if there are uh, power lines in this area down these roads. Um, do you know, Ms. Harrison? We do evaluate um, the overhead utilities when we're looking at pedestrian connectivity to ensure that there's no power poles directly in the um, middle of the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. On this particular project, um, there is not any undergrounding work that is included, but we do continue that coordination on our projects um, when they come through on design. Okay, but there are, there are power lines in the vicinity, correct? There are. Yes, there are. Yeah. So what I want to make sure is that we don't just, um, you know, that we that we assertively move forward. But I, because I think this particular area, for example, and your lane is an area that really could benefit from uninterrupted power, um, certainty of power supply. And it's the kind of thing that I want to make sure that we address. So it looks like it was not considered here. But what I'm asking you, since you're the one, is to make sure going forward that we don't we look at all utilities, including power. OK. Understood. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Martinez. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, I move to award the contract to Sierra Nevada Construction. I, for... I have a question. Oh, yep. Thanks. Go right ahead. Sorry. Just a quick question. You mentioned that this area was identified in March of 2022. Can, can I just, can you tell me what that process was like since that was prior to my time on the council? Sure. So um, as I mentioned previously, the um, city is divided into three pavement management areas and we rotate through the city in our inspection, preventative maintenance and our reconstruction. And through our pavement inspection process, we um, assign a pavement condition index or PCI, which goes from zero to 100 for all of our roads um, across the city. And then we group um, units of roads together and um, we see uh, better cost efficiency when we have several roads in a, um, in a neighborhood. And then we rank those based on pavement condition or other utility work that need to happen or proximity to um, schools, medical facilities, those types of things. And then we rank those and bring the recommendations of the units that we're proposing for reconstruction to council and then council confirms those. So the city of Reno goes out and does these ratings of the, the roads or is there, did you mention that there was community feedback in this process? We, um, city staff and consultants do the um, condition. It's a, you know, out there measuring the cracks in the roadway, all the different distresses of the pavement so that the decisions are made based on the data of the condition of the road. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I'd like to 
speak. Council Member Brackett. Yeah, I think I just want to set the record. I think Ms. Uh, Dewar was referring to some comments I made earlier about the franchise agreement, and she discussed undergrounding. My comments did not involve undergrounding. They involved reporting qual reporting requirements, particularly in fire prone areas. Of course not having the benefit of someone with special subject matter expertise in negotiating power franchise agreements on behalf of municipalities, there's things I don't know. There's questions I don't even know to ask about how to put those, embed those into our agreements. Um, but I did not use the word undergrounding, but I do have questions about undergrounding when we bring that technical expertise. But I was talking about reporting on line quality in fire prone areas because the history that we've experienced up in Ward 1 is lines above ground igniting fire. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Just to make the record clear, I was not referring to Ms. Breckis's comments. I was referring to my own. Thanks. Thank you, Vice Mayor Dewar. Any additional questions from the body at this time on this agenda item? Okay, Councilmember Martinez, we're looking for motions to approve. I move to approve item B9 and B10. Okay. I have a motion by Councilmember Martinez, seconds by Councilmember Taylor. Any additional questions at this time? Hearing none, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Madam Clerk, item B13. We'll look first for disclosures. Yeah, I have a disclosure. This item is related to a request by the city attorney for legal services pertaining to a legal proceeding, uh, a writ of mandamus that is pending a judge's order on the question that I brought on whether or not I am entitled to an administrative hearing timely with a timely request related to claims that I have made about inappropriate government and actions by our city manager, Doug Thornley, specifically an incident of drinking in the office in 21, November 21, and ongoing, ongoing retaliation by Mr. Thornley, raising questions in turn about his fitness to perform his duties. Because I am a participant in this, I, like the city attorney's office, have a conflict and will be stepping away from the dais while the council considers this item and not participate. Thank you, Madam Clerk, and please record my comments on the Okay, this item was pulled by Councilmember Ebert. The floor is yours. Uh, well, one of the reasons why I pulled it was I didn't think it would be appropriate for Councilwoman yeah, totally. Brackus to vote on it. I thought it should be pulled. I'm not quite sure why it was put on the consent items. Um, I think I, uh, Shipman, uh, our city attorney John Shipman can answer that. Yeah, I think uh, it's required. Yeah, just for the record, um, John Shipman for the city attorney's office. Uh, Carl is um, just indisposed currently. Um, now, this is just a uh, item to follow up on the investigation that has been done. And out, as you recall, outside counsel was hired for that. The city's off, city attorney's office is just serving as a conduit um, for making that happen. And this is just to increase the budget to come in line with what the legal expenses are to date. Yeah, I understand that. But having it as a consent item, I mean, that's something that we could have just block voted yes on and having that as something that, you know, it's it's in regard to council member Brackus. Like, I, I, is it really appropriate to have that as a consent item? So there's no legal requirement for it to be anywhere on the agenda other than being on the agenda. So, I mean, from a policy standpoint, if you prefer to see that under like a department item, we can do that in the future. Sure. Yeah, I think that might be more appropriate. Sure. Yeah. Um, and then also, I just had a question, you know, go, going forward with this, um, who would be our point of contact for this since it's, it's not the city attorney's office? No, it's um, um, Brian Irvine at the okay. uh, law firm Dickinson Wright. Okay, thank you. Yep. Any other questions from anybody at the dais? Council Member or Vice Mayor Dewar? No. Okay. 
I'll look for a motion. Um, I do have another question. Okay. So is this is this to cover fees that have already we've already incurred, or is this for you know potentially new lit litigation? It's it's both because the, uh, the 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 piece is in the litigation currently, and um, so yeah, the the budget they're they're incurring costs with that currently. So um, we expect the budget to hit about the hundred fifty thousand dollar mark when it's all done. Okay, so this is this is for everything. Yeah. The, the end of it. The uh, um, again, caveat being th there are things like appeals and things where potentially, um, you know, we'll need to keep on special counsel. But at this point, we're, I believe, we're just waiting for the judge's order. So. Okay. And how much have we spent towards this today? Um, I, I think it's, I'd have to get you the exact number and I can follow up with that. But I mean, we're in, in the neighborhood of about $60,000, I think, currently billed. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions at this time? Can I get a motion? I'll motion to approve. Second. Second. Any other questions at this time? Hearing none, I'll call for the questions. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Madam Clerk, can you get us back on track? Where are we? We're on item B14, pulled by Councilmember Ebert. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Members, Craig Friend, and IT Director, for the record. Councilmember Ebert, I'm here to answer any questions. I don't have a presentation, but for clarification. Yeah, I was just curious. It says $3, $3 million a year for, for equipment is needed. Is, is there an end date on this, or is just this, like we might need $3 million of equipment per year? So this is, this is, to be clear, this is not additional funds we're requesting. This is budgeted funds. Um, it just allows us to purchase off the state contract at a negotiated lower rate. Um, and we're just approving this for a five-year time period, and we did it five years ago as well. Okay. So does it say five years in the staff report? Or? It does. Okay. Okay. I'm sorry. I missed that. That's okay. Okay. That was it. I just wanted to know, like, what the time frame was sure. for that. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, motion to approve. Second. Any additional questions at this time? Hearing none, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Item B15, uh, as pulled by Councilmember Ebert. I just wanted to see, you know, what would be included in, in this. Sure. Uh, we Nathan know, Elliott, yeah. Parks and Recreation Director for the record. It's the first time I've got to say good morning. Um, I haven't made it up before noon before. So uh, I do have a presentation, if council would like to see it, about what the fitness courts are, where they would be, and um, what the plan could be for the future. So. All right. It's going to start with a video, and I'm not sure which button I hit on this to hit play, but let me just, no, that's not it. Yeah, there should be a video here. Oh, it's embedded. Welcome. The Fitness Court is the world's best outdoor gym, designed by the National Fitness Campaign in San Francisco. I'm Rob Richards, one of your pro trainers, and I'm so glad to see you. We're building hundreds of fitness courts across the nation, so you can build your daily wellness practice in your neighborhood, which will improve your health, happiness, and longevity. Our fitness courts are funded by both healthcare providers and the local cities and schools they are in. Best of all, it's outdoors, in the sunshine and fresh air. And we want you to walk, jog, or cycle to your nearby fitness court to get the muscular movement, strength, and cardio that you need. It's all here for you. The Fitness Court is the home of the incredible seven-minute full-body workout, which you're going to love. It's designed for adults of all ages and fitness levels. I can't wait to show you how it all works and how it will support you as an athlete, a regular fitness enthusiast, or as a mature adult seeking to prolong your best years by keeping your body functionally fit so that your later years can be filled with joy. My favorite thing about using the Fitness Court is how it makes me feel. Every time I perform a seven-movement full-body workout, I feel great. 
It's the best feel-good medicine on the planet, and we've got hundreds of ways to check in, train, and challenge yourself. So let's get started and see how it works. There's a ton of other videos if you'd like to check them out, but that just gives you a, a snapshot of it. Um, the fitness courts would be uh, new to the city of Reno in our parks, but have been uh, installed regionally in, uh, at Rancho San Rafael and the South Valley's Park for the county and Ardmore Park in Sparks. Uh, as you can see in the video compared to what you might have seen in the past in our facilities, there's, no, there's not really any moving parts to the court, so they're very durable, um, resistant to wear and tear, uh, easy to replace, and they take a very small footprint up in a park, so it gives us a lot of options to put them in there. So. Um, we, we went through a study with the National Fitness Campaign who produces the court and the top two parks that were recommended were DeMonte Ranch Park and Broadhead Memorial Park. Uh, and you can see on the map there, the, the lighted sections, the, the lightest sections talks about trail activity and connectivity uh, in the parks. And that's how they evaluated these. Uh, also based on our ability and willingness or desire to build in an area or to improve an area. So the park types, the activities, the access folks have to it where um, if you're running along the trail, you can stop and do a seven minute workout. There's a, an amazing app that goes with the park that allows you to plan a workout, to track your progress, things like that. So it's got some great interactive components. And the ultimate goal of this is to activate park spaces um, so that uh, from a fitness standpoint, which has been long-term a goal for the city, and we have a lot of fitness equipment in different parks, uh, but this would be a, a new model for that. Um, so there's the budget. We received a, uh, a grant uh, for, for the project, uh, which would include the, um, which would offset the cost for the city, which we would be funding through our, or our residential construction tax in District 4. So that's my presentation. Any questions? So, yes, sorry. Thank you for the presentation. So was any of the equipment from the video what will actually be at the park? It, it, will, it will look very similar. There is a branding partnership with Renown um, that, so they'll be purple instead of blue in some of those spaces, but the equipment will be exactly like that nationwide app that, that our residents and visitors will have an opportunity to connect with and, and track progress here or in any of the other parks. Interesting. Okay, thank you. Thank Welcome. you for the presentation. Okay, any other questions? Councilmember Martinez. Thank you so much. I just kind of, I appreciate uh, the work in getting the grant and uh, to our partners for helping us sponsor uh, this, at least a third of it, which is great. Um, I also wanted to highlight uh, the fact that we're including prevailing wage in here, increasing access to outdoor recreation along the river, which is something that we've been looking at and activating um, that trail. Um, and then also, again, highlighting you and the staff for uh, attaining those grants. So thank you for the work. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Chair. Count, uh, Vice Mayor Dewar. Yes, um, thank you. I too wanted to compliment our park staff for thinking outside the box, so to speak, and getting this type of activity going. Activity is incredibly important to health, obviously. We all know it, whether we participate or not. And uh, to Councilmember Martinez's point, I love that it's along the river. Um, I also love that uh, the other establishment is going to be in Damani Ranch Park. Um, why that's important is most of all of the other sites that uh, Mr. Uliot mentioned are far, far, far from South Reno. They are uh, at Rancho San Rafael and other central locations. So it's great. I know the residents down south will be grateful to have a new activity there, given that um, you know much of the park had fallen in disrepair and we're in a, a and a moment of trying to bring that up to shape. Thank you. Okay, we'll come back to you, Councilmember Ebert. Did you want to make a motion? Sure, I'll make a motion to approve. I have a motion by Ms. Second. Ebert, a second by Mr. Martinez. Any additional questions at this time? Hearing none, I'll call for the question. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. All right, Madam Mayor, if you are ready, we're moving into our C items, our public hearing items. So we're on item C1, which is a bill or an ordinance introduction to be read by the city attorney's office. Okay, thank you so much. At this time, uh, at this time, we will now open, oh, do you have any public comment on this item? Sorry. Oh, well, now we will open the public hearing. Better get that on the record. Has proper notice been given? Any correspondence received? 
Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, proper notice has been given on this item and no correspondence was received. Okay, thank you so much. I'm gonna actually now send it to our city attorney, John Chipman. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, this is ordinance introduction, bill number 7263, case number ANX 24-00002, Dermody Trust Annexation Ordinance, annexing to and making part of the city of Reno certain specifically described territory of a portion each of two parcels being plus or minus 4,113 square feet of property generally located south of Aspen Trail and north of Bridal Way, together with other matters which pertain to or are necessarily connected therewith. The site is adjacent to the city of Reno's jurisdictional boundary but is not located within the sphere of influence. Upon annexation, the site will have a large lot neighborhood LL master plan land use designation and a large lot residential one acre LLR one zoning designation ward one. All right, thank you. <laughs> you ready? Carter's up. Madam Mayor, I, d I don't know if we need a staff report. I just have a few questions. Okay, go right ahead. Yeah, yeah. The question number one was when I asked my liaison, uh, annexations were within, are we within 100 days of an election? What's the statue on that? So the, in this case, this annexation is with, located within Ward 1, but it's actually within the Ward 2 election district, which is the post re, the redistricting process. It's not a subject to an election, the election year. So that section that you referenced, 293-209 NRS, wouldn't apply in this case. Are you sure? Because, you know, the concept is not just, you know, the, our city. It's, for example, well... You know, there are other offices, I think, that would come into play. But did you run that by attor the attorneys? We did. Um, okay. And I'd also note that the second section of that NRS section also states that it doesn't prevent annexations. It just prevents the, ex the change to the election district. Okay. Okay. So. Okay. And that's fine. And then the other issue is, um, you know, I believe in the regional cooperation. And embedded in that is that cities have programs of annexation where you forecast out into the world where you're going for the next 20 years. And then you move accordingly to annexing those, not just one that comes out of the way, such as above the hills of Damani Ranch where we've been doing quarter sections and then we have lots of issues with horses and the city just annexes that even though we have no forecasting of that as a growth area. But, so I've consistently voted against annexation since we have fallen out of compliance with a program of annexation. This one is a minor cleanup because it's just a sliver of an existing parcel, correct, coming correct. in? So I will support it and I will make the motion. Thank you. If, it, you know, if, if you're ready for a motion. Go, go right ahead. Okay. I, I move to um, move, refer this to our second reading. Second. All right, I have a motion from Councilwoman Breckus, a second from Councilman Reese. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Aye. Okay, motion carries. All right, Madam Clerk, I believe we're going into, uh, well, we pulled item C2, so actually, sorry, we're going to go into D1. Any public comment on this item, Madam Clerk? There are none. Nope. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry. My microphone didn't turn on. Um, See that there is none. <laughs> we do have one hand raised in Zoom from Art Rangel. We'll go ahead and move him over now. And for the record, I would like to note that we did receive 12 comments, which were dire directly associated with this agenda item prior to 4 p.m. yesterday. One letter in favor, eight letters of opposition, and three letters of concern. Okay. Thank you so much. Perfect. I thought we moved this one. D1? Uh, no, this is D1. You're thinking C2. I think that's D correct. D2, two, three, and four have been withdrawn from this agenda. Council Member Rekas. Okay. And um, C2, Art, C2 was moved. Correct. Art Rangel, if you would unmute, state your name for the record, and begin speaking. Great, thank you, uh, Council Members. My name is Art Rangel. Um, as a uh, and speaking to the issue of accessory dwelling units, uh, as a retired city planner, I've, I've been a proponent of accessory dwelling units for decades for the following reasons. First of all, the homeowner can decide if he or she wants to or does not want to have an AUD on their property. In addition, the homeowner is, a good, is in a good position to monitor who is living on their property. Secondly, unlike most afford, uh, affordable housing, ADUs are typically not subsidized by the governmental uh, agencies and taxpayers. 
But just a reminder, uh, Reno Municipal, uh, I'm sorry, Reno, Reno Master Plan Policy N-G.6 relative to accessory dwelling units reads as follows. Accessory dwelling units, when permitted, should be located in the rear or a, or a re, of a regular lot or side of the corner lot and be subordinate to the primary structure in terms of, of scale. Access should be oriented away from the other units. So, so I'm absolutely in the support of this. Thank you. With that, Madam Mayor, we have no additional public comment on this item. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. The floor is yours. Nice to see you. It's been a while. To see you guys as well. Good afternoon, Madam Mayor, Council Members, Grace McAdin, Senior Management Analyst, here to discuss the survey results for ADUs or accessory dwelling units. So as a reminder, an ADU is a smaller independent dwelling unit located on the same lot as a single family home. These are currently not allowed in most areas of the city. Now for some background. On November 1st, this council initiated a text amendment related to ADUs. As part of that initiation, council stressed the importance of neighborhood outreach and getting feedback from all neighborhoods within the city. In the past, city staff has struggled to get public interest and involvement in many of the projects we are doing. In an attempt to get as much involvement as possible, staff published a survey which asked questions about ADUs. This survey was open from January 1st until February 29th with over 2,000 participants. Of the 2,000 people who participated, almost 67% were in favor of ADUs, about 15% were not in favor, and about 16% were in favor if they were in certain neighborhoods. When participants were asked what their concerns were regarding ADUs, short-term rental allowances, parking, and lot sizes were all listed as some, some of the most common concerns. So something that was very important to us based on council direction was to be able to map the survey results so we could see if there were any clusters of a certain answer in a certain neighborhood or area. As you can see, the question of should ADUs be allowed in the city of Reno is still overwhelmingly positive. And even when you zoom in on some of those red clusters, which are the no votes, you can see that the area as a whole is more supportive of ADUs. And then on the right, we have the question, or the answer to the question of how likely people would be to build an ADU. And we see that this is still likely uncertain for most people, um, most likely due to the cost of construction. However, when reviewing the responses of those who would likely be able to build an ADU, you can see that many of them would like to have one for a family member that can't afford to live here, extra space, or some extra income to help them with their mortgage. So as part of the survey, we had an open-ended question that allowed people to share concerns or thoughts that were not addressed in the survey. Staff reviewed these comments and put together some of the common themes. Within the common themes, staff found that people thought of ADUs as a potential solution to affordable housing, thought ADUs could provide diverse housing options, but they had concerns about the impact on neighborhood character and about parking. With these themes and the feedback received, staff is confident that we could start to draft an ordinance that addresses and mitigates some of these concerns. So if council would like us to continue moving forward, our next steps will be to draft the ordinance, go to NAB meetings, conduct community outreach or meetings, go to the planning commission, city council, and then hopefully adopt an ordinance. So with that, staff is looking for a direction from council on moving forward. The recommended motion is on your screen and I'm available for questions. All right, thank you so much. Okay, I'm going to send it over to Councilman Reese. Go ahead. Ms. McEnany, thank you for the presentation. I appreciate it very much. I have a couple of questions. The first is, tell me what the status is of our uh, regional partners, the county and the city of Sparks. I know that the county has recently moved forward with something similar. Mm -hmm. So where are we region-wide? Washoe County has allowed for ADUs for quite some time. Um, they've allowed for them with a conditional use permit or what would be the equivalent of a conditional use permit. And they just recently allowed the um, move forward to make those more permissive because they were seeing that they kind of placed the same conditions on each um, 
application that comes in. So they just expanded their ADU ordinance. Sparks is a little bit more unique. Um, they do allow for ADUs, but they have a lot of PUDs also in the mix or plan unit developments. Um, and so it, it's a little bit harder to have a consistent um, feedback on kind of what their regulations are. So for my part, and I, I know that today is just uh, a direction to staff to move forward, it, are you asking for very specific and minute details of what we would like to see? It, uh, no, no. no. Okay. Um, thank you for that question. I think um, based on the feedback we've received, we will go forward to go to all of the neighborhood advisory board meetings as well as do some stakeholder meetings to kind of propose what we are thinking based on the feedback we've received. Um, and then we will bring that back to planning commission and back to council kind of at that point looking for some feedback. But I think that's my ultimate concern is I believe that the neighborhood advisory boards will be the true barometer for whether or not each uh, NAB is looking for uh, the ability to have ADUs. I think generally I'm favorably disposed to ADUs, but they won't impact my neighborhood quite as much because my neighborhood exists in, inside of some fairly restrictive HOA laws and rules and regulations. So I don't know what, for example, the Ward 5 Neighborhood Advisory Board will think of it. I think there are some neighborhoods, for example, within Somerset that do currently allow um, ADUs. It's oddly the one place in the city where it's allowed. Um, but I also am thinking that there are other neighborhoods, maybe in the older southwest part of the city, that are not particularly favorably disposed to it. And so I, I'll be interested to know what their engagement process is. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if we've received a number of concerns over the last 10 days about the affordable housing component and the ADUs, I think people have been generally favorably disposed to ADUs, but they have concerns about, you know, heights, setbacks particularized neighborhoods, and those are the things that I am particularly keen to find out what our communities are thinking about. So for me, I can't say I have a blanket predilection towards allowing ADUs everywhere without review, um, and so I, I still think that those are important concepts about review, and also each of the various neighborhood advisory boards will have to weigh significantly in on how the introduction of ADUs into a particular neighborhood would impact that neighborhood or that community. So again, and my and this is for my colleagues generally have some favorable predisposition to ADUs. I don't know that it will be a panacea to solve our all of our housing woes. I think it'll be probably one offs here and there of people who are interested in it, like you said, for people who are uh, maybe they're looking for a, a mother in law's quarters or they have college age kids. But I don't think it will be the silver bullet, as one of the commentators said earlier this morning. So I want to make sure that we're being appropriate with the various neighborhoods who will be impacted the most by the ADUs. To use presence. Thank you so much. All right. Hi. Oh, hi. How are you? Great. Good. Thanks. Good to see you. Huh. Okay. Uh, I'm going to send it over to Councilman Breckis. Yeah. I believe it. I think your hand is up, correct? Well, I, I'll speak. Um, okay. My button is button. There is push. Yeah, I'm looking at the buttons right oh, now. Oh, okay. Oh. I didn't know I how. Didn't know. I don't. I, I didn't know if that signaled something. Mean? Then I'm going to call on you. Okay. So, I didn't ahead, know. Councilman I didn't know you Breckis. had how it was working. You know, I think because this concept has had so many fits and starts, I think we need to give a little more direction. I mean, you have ideas, okay? And so let's get the ideas out here. Um, I wish this was maybe a little more broader where you were, you know, rather than survey says, <laughs> you know? And so I talked, last time this came forward, I said dust off the 2016 ordinance and, cause that had- 2018. 2018 ordinance draft dust that off and use that as the starting point. And unfortunately, I don't see it in the packet and I wasn't briefed on this because I'm not getting briefings. Um, but I, I think that we need to send them off with some parameters um, or some starting point because open-ended stuff is good when you're doing the master plan. <laughs> what do you like about your community, what you don't like? But when you're doing bulk and density standards, you need specificity. Okay, and I know I know you're you're not a planner, you're a senior management analyst, but you know, moving forward with this ordinance, we need to kind of tighten it down a little bit. I, I think some cities, and I'll just you know, because I'm 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 studying this quite a bit right now. Some cities um, aren't aren't requiring parking for ADUs. Just you know, th and that's a big issue. Do you do, does there have to be parking or not? You know, I think you frame the question so parking is a question. You know. So that should be a decision-making point to the council. Do you want these to be parked per our code or not? I think that's gonna be a threshold. Minimum size, 
I'm teaching, I just had my students look at a code as a part of a quiz to tell me what that code's minimum size was. You know, I'm trying to test them on how to, how to read codes. Well, the minimum size was 850 square feet. And I think that should be a minimum size of 850 square feet. Some go up to 750, some go 500. Some have these junior ADUs in California, but 850 sounds good to me. So parking, 850, and then process. I really think that, um, and I think an earlier iteration you came forward with, um, or maybe it's embedded in the code now, is a conditional use permit or a special use permit. That, that should have no place. It should go non-discretionary. Um, because in, in my view. So, um, you know, I think we also have some zero lot line issues to deal with that are flawed in the code. And then of course we need a short term rental. But um, I, I don't know, I kind of think council that we need to tell, ask her to come back and sketch it out a little bit more to the council on what the parameters of this ordinance would be like. So the council says, yes, that's the starting point. Go forward and get input on these. Because otherwise, we're just letting them go forward and they may even have the drafts out there. But let's let's own it a little bit so we can move it forward because we've we've been kicking this down the road a long time. Thank you. All right, go ahead, Councilwoman Door. <clears throat> Excuse me, all right, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, back in the day, I guess you said it was 2018, but I think it started a little sooner mm -hmm. um, than that, maybe two years even. Um, I've, I've been pretty supportive of ADUs, and, and that's with a but. I wanted to uh, correct um, Council Member Reese said his development in Somerset was the only one, but actually um, Greenfield, yeah. to my knowledge, um, is, has been a, a long time on the books allowing ADUs, specifically in both um, the neighborhood plan and their CCNRs. So, um, and for a variety of reasons, but the biggest reason most compelling to me are the family issues, the issues of um, senior parents, uh, children who are being challenged to find housing in our community but need some privacy. Um, there was a comment made by the public that the owner's right by so they can be surveyed, but I don't think there's any requirement that the owner live on site. And so I just want to correct that, that both of these units could be rentals potentially, the main house, let's call it, and the ADU. Um, I'm not opposed to that. I think, you know, that makes a beautiful rental, frankly. But to that end, I think we do need parking because, and I think... One of the things that would be good to do and to conceive of is to bring the ADU, but also with the short-term rental. Because if the ADU is really just really another name for a short-term rental, then we need to get our arms around that and handle it. And we need to understand what the county, what Sparks has done, what's happening up at Incline, and address these sort of contemporaneously. Because do you think that's one of the bigger issues and concerns? So... I'm glad you asked that question. We did combine those in the survey, and I think a lot of people asked that question as to why we did. Um, and we're not blind to the history. We know that this has been a contentious issue, and so we are learning from past ordinances and kind of looking to what was working and what people supported and what people didn't. And through all communities, short-term rentals come up as a constant concern and issue as if somebody builds an ADU, they're just going to rent it out on Airbnb. B and B and BRBO. It's going to diminish the neighborhood feel of my of my home. Parking's going to be an issue. Parties are going to be an issue. Um, and so instead of people saying we don't want it to be an Airbnb, we wanted to find out why. Is it the parking? Is it the parties? Is it the um, people that are coming in and out? Is it truly the length of stay? Um, and what we found that it was a lot more mixed than the ADU responses were. And so it was about 50-50 of people thinking that short-term rentals should or shouldn't be allowed. Um, and from the other communities, we've learned it's a big enforcement undertaking. And so I think from my perspective, if we were to propose a short-term re short rental ordinance, it should be separate from the ADU ordinance just because I think it's a bigger beast. Okay. So bigger beast, but yet if we allow the ADUs, I mean, immediately someone builds it, it's very likely to become a short-term rental. So I want to just make sure that... We I support short-term rentals in general. I mean, I've used them myself, right? Across America, in other countries. It's a great place to stay. Um, we don't party hard, right? My husband and I, we just go, sleep, uh, live in the neighborhood, so we don't cause a big distraction. But I have seen it where people use the ADU uh, 
or short-term rental as a big party house, family reunion, those kind of things where you're having 10 or more people. And I don't want to speak over my time, so I'll just end it there, but maybe on a second round I'll have a few more questions. I, so I'm glad that you um, want to address that differently because that, that is a different situation. Now more than ever, we have seen things change and um, generations change and families evolve and those things. So we're seeing this be very, very attractive for um, you know younger folks that like to be with mom and dad but not quite want to leave, right? We're seeing that. And then also um, lots of seniors where you know um, it's now we're taking care of our parents, mm -hmm. and so that's another additional way. So um, the other thing I will say is, like, the, how long have we been looking at this? I would say this has been five or six years now. I'm on on the other side of what Councilwoman Breckis thinks. I feel like this is something that we've been talking about and talking about, and then didn't want to address, didn't want to address because some people are saying, "Oh no, it's going to devalue our properties." I mean, we've heard all of this stuff, and um, and I also understand those concerns at the same time. But quite honestly, we've been talking and talking and talking about this. And I do think that they are a, a viable solution to a lot of families and to present affordability in some capacity. Um, now, of course, I want to be sensitive to not every neighborhood might be conducive to it. We see it like in the Newlands area where the streets are smaller and what, you know, and they worry about, you know, the parking, especially if it turns into an Airbnb and, and I understand all that. But I do think like if the council does really care about affordable housing, this is another tool in the toolbox. Is it going to solve everything? Absolutely not. But it is a tool and um, I think that we should move forward. So that's, that's kind of where I'm at. Uh, I'm going to send it to you. Councilman Breckis, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I'll reiterate again is, you know, the mayor raises this question, are they appropriate for other neighborhoods? I think that we should have that question before us. You, you know, are they parking? Are there size? I think we should have five or six thing, items before us to give you direction to go and say, you know, get the feedback on those. Because otherwise, it's just way too open-ended. I mean, I'm glad you you know, what you said about the air, the short-term rentals, because I was, I was not happy seeing the survey drafted, putting the two together. I knew it was going to be problematic, but, um, like the mayor, I don't support Ms. Dewar's idea of, you know, bringing the two ordinances together at the same time. Uh, they really are different creatures and the short-term rentals going to need a lot of thinking and it has a licensing component and they're not necessarily interrelated in a way because um, you know say you get the ADU ordinance on and people start production and they're like I build it for a short-term rental well too bad the council has decided we only are going to have you know 400 of those licensed each one for three years and you know this is our new regulatory framework we can certainly Relicense if someone's doing a short-term rental, relicense them and and make the statement that you know this is how it's going to be, and someone will, so an owner will have to either you know win a, a license or rent it out. But um, you know I've been a I've been probably I think the biggest advocate of short-term rentals and um, regulation. It's just remarkable to me that a city like ours hasn't done one yet. It's the party houses, but increasingly it was the housing, affordable housing supply in desirable areas. You know, it was taking so much housing out of commission for our working families and households. So that's where um, we need to get this done and then move on to that one and also make sure in the new communities that they cannot be restricted out and that they're going to be a use um, going forward in those. So I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a little... Um, frustrated again that um, council's just going to say, okay, thank you for the survey, go out again. I, I really think we need to start doing more work here at this table on giving a little more direction to staff. And I'd like to see the ADU ordinance come back with the decision point of eight or nine features, parking, size, as of right, neighborhood, for example, so that we check those boxes. And we can always reverse, but we send staff out with some direction because we're just not getting things done when we don't do things that way. Thanks. 
Okay. Go ahead, Councilwoman. Yeah, Moore. thank you. Um, well, first of all, I, I don't want to, anyone to mischaracterize my statement. I, I asked a question, mm -hmm. did not make a statement that we needed to bring these together. I caution people that if people begin to build ADUs, but we don't have a short-term rental ordinance in place, that we should be prepared for that. And, and you, you were obviously thinking about it too. Yes and no. I think we know it's a concern of people, um, but I, I think that there might be some, um, people might be scared because they're ADUs, and I think there's this fear of ADUs becoming short-term rentals, but currently you could turn anything into an short-term rental. Well, that's what I, well, that's what I was going to say, so, is that any building, any residence can be the whole house, uh, yes. a portion of the house. Correct. And so we have a separate unit in the, on the property. We have guest cottages, which just can't have a kitchen. Those can be rented out. I mean, we don't regulate these at all. Exactly. And so ADU is not the, the, the thing that's going to cause short-term right. rentals, but I do think it's something that we need to learn from our community as to why they're concerned about them okay. and in the future kind of build on that. So the other thing I wanted to say, so again, I'm going to restate so we're not confused. I'm very supportive. I have been supportive for eight years. Um, and the reasons I stated, primarily because of family issues, mm -hmm. I think are a big driver. And family is associated with affordability. Um, what I'm interested in is last time we went down this path, um, we did have objections from certain areas. And I was really interested to see your map. Mm -hmm. Could we see that again? Um, of the people that had concerns. And that would be, so tell us which, which so are the two maps. So on the left is the answer to should ADUs be allowed in the city? So this was the first answer to the, the Green the is yes, red Green is, is no. Green is yes, red is no, and yellow is yes, but only in certain neighborhoods. Okay. And then on the right is how likely would you be to build an ADU? Um, and we can see that that's fairly small, um, but funny enough- No, I, I don't know. Blue is yes in so, this case? So, um, sorry, yes. Blue is actually, I don't own a home. Wait, the dark blue or the light dark blue? Dark blue is I don't own a home. Okay. Um, the red is unlikely. The green, which you can see very few I can in barely there, see, yeah. Is very likely. And then the yellow or orange is maybe. Um, okay. And so interesting enough, I talked to, you know, we get a couple inquiries every couple months of somebody who, you know, my kid can't afford a house and going to college, like we talked about. Um, and interestingly enough, I talked to someone today about this. So it's still going to be very minimal and incremental change just based on what people can afford to do. Okay. Well, then lastly, I just want to respond. I think that Councilmember Breckis is correct on one aspect from my perspective, and that is the Planning Commission made a big change today on affordable housing from what the staff recommended. And then it was coming straight to council. And that was problematic because it was a big change. Well, what if staff right makes a recommendation on this and the planning commission again makes a big change? Do we just have an ordinance in front of us? I, I think her point is correct. When do we get to talk about this? When do we very specifically get to say yes or no on parking, yes or no on all the questions? And what I would recommend on that piece is let us do the neighborhood outreach and then we can have briefings or we can kind of propose it to you guys as to, we already have so much information based on past ordinances, based on the feedback from this survey okay. as to what people want to see in an ordinance. Um, let us draft it. We can have council briefings with you once we get a little bit more fleshed out right. um, and we can provide feedback well, at that time. I'll end on this. I have council briefings and when I make suggestions for changes, I don't often see those reflected. Mm -hmm. It's more of a one-way communication of you telling me, not you personally, but staff telling me what is in the proposal. It's not so much me saying, okay, I'm good with that, but I don't like this. I rarely ever see that change. So I'm not really sure how we effectively you know, interact with the ordinance. And we can, um, when we come to the NABs, we'll obviously have, all, well, not obviously, but we will post all of this stuff online to have con consistent feedback from the neighbors and neighborhood. And so what I would like to do is is keep track of kind of the different iterations of this ordinance as we get different feedback. Okay. Um, and so hopefully we can say, you know, Council Member Dewar, at your NAB, this came up and here's how that resulted in a change so that you can physically see how it's evolved. Okay, thank you. Madam, oh, one second. Uh, go ahead, uh, Councilman Martinez. 
Thanks so much, Madam Mayor. Thanks, uh, Ms. McDonald, for your work um, on this. I think, you know, being one of the newer members on the council, I think it, to me, I'd like to applaud you for the openness in the questions on the surveys because you. It seems like you took into consideration what was ha happening in 2018 and some of those discussions that have already happened, but. We've lived through a global pandemic and things may be a little bit different. We did have a huge influx of folks moving into our area as well over the last few years. And so I think having a bigger, broader base of information to start off with is going to help us move forward. And now that you have some guidance and input from the rest of the council members, maybe specifying um, on the questions that come up next and taking this out to the NABs um, and uh, to our neighborhoods and making sure that we're collecting those data points. Uh, I was very intrigued by the maps um, and, the, and the difference there. So even folks who may not own a home were still uh, actively participating uh, in, in this survey question. Um, I, I know this may be a little bit more technical, but I was just curious if you could tell me um, what the restrictions or the conditions are currently for ADUs? Like, are they able to take up a whole empty lot that you have in your house? Or if you can kind of explain that. Sure. Us. So our restrictions on ADUs are fairly restrictive. Um, most areas of the city, short of what um, Council Member Dewar and Reese had described earlier, there's some pockets of communities that do allow for them. But for the most part, we prohibit ADUs or accessory dwelling units. We do allow for something called a guest quarters, and that is an accessory structure without a kitchen. And so it's a bedroom, bathroom, office, something like that. Um, and we have some fairly restrictive guidelines for compatibility, materials that you can use, the roof pitch has to be similar to the principal structure, um, things of that nature, lot size and size of the uh, guest quarters is separate from just accessory structures as a whole. And so it does get into a fairly um, specific language as far as guest quarters go, but they're not ADUs. Okay, yeah, and I appreciate you. Because they don't have a kitchen, is that the one defining? Yep. Yeah, so I appreciate you honing in a little bit more on that. I did have some questions about the size, design, and setbacks. We've already addressed some of that, so I appreciate um, you bringing that up. Thank you. All right, Councilwoman Breckis, Yeah, I mean, you know, um, I think guest quarters can't be rented out, okay, because they're not for habitations. I, I think that's correct. It, we, we can't really regulate that, though. Yeah, um, it does. Yeah, but the intent of yeah, that is true. Yeah, yeah. Can I think it would be a code violation? Um, you know. <laughs> I, I, I'm not getting briefings. That's part of the retaliatory scheme of Mr. Thornley. Um, but I would submit to all of my colleagues who are getting briefings that our input, our status on this issue is a little bit more than a NAB meeting. I, I, you know, we have expertise, we have obligations, and we're, you know, been working on it, a lot of us, for so long that we ha know something about it. And, you know, I have 30 years of code writing experience, and when a when a body is tackling with something really difficult, it's not let's go on out and have open-ended conversations. Let's get something in front of the governing body that takes the final vote to enact it and at least send some marching orders out to staff. So if I was called to make a recommendation of a motion, I would recommend that staff come back within two or three meetings with eight or 10 standard provisions, applicability procedure, provisions, procedures for the council to vote on as general guidance for the ordinance as you go forward, okay? Okay, thank you. Go ahead, Councilwoman uh, Dewar. I, I didn't have my hand. Okay, well, I'm, I'm sorry. Just, I'm going by the green. Sorry. Councilwoman Evert. <laughs> no? Okay. Uh, then go ahead, Councilwoman Breckis, why don't you give me a motion? Yeah, I'm gonna motion that staff be directed to return to us within you know, two or three meetings with, you know, eight to 10 decision points for us to make about the standards, the procedures, and the applicability of ADUs in, uh, you know, in the code. And with that, we will make decision votes, and then you'll have the outline for a suggestive ordinance to bring through a public review process. Okay. That's my motion. Do you. You, do you understand the... That motion? Okay. Yes, she understands. Okay. Thank you. All right. 
Um, I have a motion. Well, I'll second for discussion. And I have a second. Questions. Go ahead, discussion. Councilwoman Dewar. Yeah. Um, so my question is, your procedure that you were envisioning, mm -hmm. you would, you said we have a lot, but you were going to go to the NABs to do what? Pro propose a draft. So With we a draft. Will, we will bring a draft to the NABs. Okay. Correct. So if that's the case, like you're going to go draft a draft and bring it to the NABs, I would rather you get our input before you draft. And let me just to break down our typical process when typically when council initiates an ordinance, we will just come back with a draft. And so this is a little unique because we did the survey. We wanted to come back, keep council in the loop. Um, and so typically we will go write an ordinance, go to the NABs, and we can come to council after that point. Yeah. But it's... Well, Here's, here's what I think is good process. about this is I want you to have success. And we, we are the people that will say yes or no. And I, I want you to go forward with at least a concept that might be supported by the council. And there's a lot of devil in the details, right? We might say some parking, but they might say, you might say how much. And you might fill in that blank for one or two cars, let's say. And you might take that to the NABs, and they may say, why do we need any parking? You know, whatever. My, my parents don't park, you know, that are going to live in the ADU. Um, so I would love some general guidance for you to take, because I want success. I want, when you come back, we're going to vote in the affirmative, you know, with what you're supporting. Mm -hmm. So that's, I guess, why I'm, I'd like to give you some advanced thoughts before you draft. All right, any other discussion? Go right ahead, Councilwoman Taylor. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I guess for discussion purposes, it seems to me that we've given you direction and that's what you're trying to do. Um, we asked you to do outreach and research and that's what you're doing. So I think to change direction would be saying something different. And then based on our direction or our action today of pulling C2, based on not having enough public comment, having enough input, it doesn't seem consistent to me, so I don't think I'll be supporting this this motion as is, and I appreciate the work that you've done on this. Thank you. Okay. And one Anyone more else? comment. Go ahead. You know, we did pull C2, and there was a dramatic change. at the. I read all the minutes from the Planning Commission meeting on C2, and they all said, well, this is a very big departure, but we'll leave it up to council to have a thorough discussion and figure it out. And they all probably scale it back, but we're okay with that. And almost every single c commissioner said the same thing, that they had gone possibly a step too far and that we would rein it in and figure it out with the public. Well, we were presented an ordinance, and that's not a setting for us to be able to have that kind of negotiation and setting. I mean, an ordinance, you're voting up or down. But, but they all said that at Planning Commission with the expectation that we would do that work. And so rather than have them do all their work, come to us, and then we have to rework it and send it back to them, I'm saying I think it makes some kind of sense to get our input at least early. You may bring back an ordinance that's different than the parameters that we suggest because you've heard something different at either the public, the neighborhood, or the planning commission, and that's okay. At least we had a firm ground for a starting point. So I'm, I'm going to support. Okay. All right, go, go ahead. Thank, thanks so much, Madam Mayor. Just a quick um, input on my own experience, and if you can possibly have a draft ordinance when you, when I have my briefing, just because I'm that's just not my area of expertise, I'll be blunt with that and say that I prefer some material to work with and information to go off of as we continue these discussions. So if you do have initial draft ordinances, even if it's the draft of the draft, um, if you can bring that to the staff, the briefing that I get, I think it will help me in that conversation. Thank you. All right. Anyone else before we move on? Okay. Uh, first of all, Grace, I want to say thank you so much. I want to thank all of our staff because they've been looking at the ADU ordinance for a long, years and years and years. And it's one of those things that is very difficult because half the people seem to love it and the other half seem to hate it. Uh, so it's very, it can get very, very contentious. But I want you to know, um, I think our our staff is incredibly talented. I look forward to whatever it is you bring forward. Um, you guys are the experts. I, I want you to remember that. Uh, this is what you guys do, what you went to school for, what you're good at. Um, and so I have a lot of faith that you'll bring back something um, that is amenable to this council. But I'm really looking forward to supporting it. And um, I, I also think you guys have been sort of excited in a way to see 
more tools in the toolbox for housing options. Um, you know, this can help families in different types of ways and, um, you know, people that want to have a roof over their head. So I just want to say thank you because I kind of feel like in some ways, you know, you've got to get up here and present and, you know, you're just, <laughs> you're, you're just serving the message. And so <laughs> I want to make sure you guys are all recognized because um, Angela and your team have done a fantastic job on ADUs. I look forward to uh, supporting what you guys bring because I value... Uh, your input greatly and your expertise. So thank you. I wanted to make sure that you you knew that. Thank you. All right. Uh, so I have a motion. I have a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those aye. opposed? Uh, motion carries. All right. Thanks so much. Good job. Good job. Very good job. Tough audience here, Grace. <laughs> thank you. All right, Madam Clerk. Thanks, Madam Mayor. We're moving on to item F1. F is in Frank 1, in ordinance adoption to be read by the city attorney's office. All right, I'm going to send it right back to you, Mr. Shipman. Thanks so much, Madam Mayor. This is uh, ordinance number 6671, um, case number LDC. Oh, Miss Dory, I just wanted, Miss Dory, um, I've reached out to you before to meet. I would love it if um, you would uh, respond. That would be great. Thank you so much. We haven't officially met, but I... I heard that you were sitting over here, so I wanted to say hello and make sure I addressed you. Thanks for coming. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Okay, sorry, Jonathan, yeah, go no ahead. Worries. Um, this is ordinance number 6671, uh, case number LDC 24-00039, Casa de Rey Historic Resource Designation Ordinance to Amend Title 18, Chapter 18.02 of the Reno Municipal Code entitled Zoning, Rezoning a Plus or Minus 0.12 Acre Site from Single Family Residential, Eight Units Per Acre, SF8, to plus or minus 0.12 acres as a F SF8 with a historical, with a historic landmark overlay zoning district. The subject property is located at 990 Joaquin Miller Drive in the Newlands Historic District and has a master plan land use designation of single family neighborhood SF Ward 1. I'll move to adopt. Okay, Councilman Breckis, that's, that's you. Okay, I have a motion from Councilwoman Breckis, a second from Councilwoman Dewar. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries. Item F2, ordinance adoption to be read by the city attorney's office. Send it right back to you, Mr. Thank you, Shipman. Madam Mayor, yes. Um, this is ordinance number 6627, case number LDC 24-00040. Garrett Humphrey House Historic Resource Designation Ordinance to Amend Title 18, Chapter 1802 of the Reno Municipal Code entitled Zoning, Rezoning a Plus or Minus 0.11 Acre Site from Multifamily Residential 14 Units per Acre MF14 to a Plus or Minus 0.11 Acres of MF14 with Historic Landmark HL Overlay dis Zoning District. The subject property is located at 655 South Arlington Avenue in the Newlands Historic District and has a Master Plan Use Designation of Mixed Neighborhood MX, Ward 1. Move to adopt. Sorry, just uh, sorry, for the oh, correction there. of the record, the ordinance number for F1 should have been 6671. Okay. And the ordinance number for F2 should be 6672. I think you said 6627. Oh. Just want to verify for the record. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so that is on the record, and I believe Councilman Breckis, you gave me a vote, uh, yep. motion? Second. Yep. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Okay, back at you, Madam Clerk. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Moving on to item G1, which is a Ward 2 Neighborhood Advisory Appointment from Councilmember Doerr. Yeah, right. Councilmember thank Doerr, you. Go ahead. Yeah, at this time, I'd like to appoint Stan Dowdy and David Titzel. Oh, I love Stan. Yeah. She's and, gonna uh, be great on there. Yep, with more interviews to come. Great, okay, awesome. And your second pick is great too. Thank you. Good people, okay. Uh, so you gave me a motion? Yes. Can I get a second? second? A second. I have a second, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries, okay. Item G2 is a appointment to the Reno Arts and Culture Commission, but um, Councilmember Reese is out of the room at the moment. So if you'd like, we can bring this back after break. Yes, let's bring it back. Okay. So then we're on break until our 6 p.m. It is 12 18. We will see you then. All right, I have we'll a question about. Everyone, everyone at 6, go ahead. Are we Council going into Breakfast? an attorney client? 
I believe we are. Is, yes, is Madam the Mayor. attorney's office representing us in this meeting? Because um, last time they said they weren't, and just, yes, because just, we had a contract, and I got a copy of the contract, and there is not a contract. So yeah, just for clarification, this is not an attorney-client meeting. It is a, um, a labor meeting, and yes, there will be a representative a, from the city attorney's yeah, office. Yeah, for the there. meeting of a city council, the charter yes. says the attorney's office should be there. Okay, thank you. All right, thanks. We will see everyone will be back there at too. six. Thanks so much. Yes. that are
Okay. It's just I normally don't know. Uh, well, we're going to go back to G2. Madam Clerk, just let us know when you are ready. We are ready. We are. Okay, Madam Vice Mayor, if you're ready to call this meeting back to order, yep. we can do so. It okay. is 6 o'clock, and at this time, Councilmember Martinez and Mayor Shevi is absent. Okay. And um, if you would like, we'll go ahead and reopen. Oh, there's Councilmember Martinez, so we'll just yep. reconvene with uh, Mayor Shevi absent at this time. So sure. we're on item G2, right. George 2, appointment to the Reno, Reno Arts and okay. Culture Commission. All right. We're calling the Reno City Council meeting of March 27th back to order. Um, just for purposes, you sort of did take a roll, but can you just take a roll? Sure. sure. Okay. Councilmember Varekas? Here. Doerr? Here. Martinez? Here. Ebert? Here. Taylor? Here. Reese? Here. Sheevy absent at this time. All right. And we'll convene with item G2, which is discussion of potential reappointment or appointment of up to four individuals to the Reno Arts and Culture Commission. And we have Councilmember Reese, who's their liaison. Do you have uh, some recommendations for us? Yes, thank you, Madam Vice Mayor. At this time, and based on the consultation with the Reno Arts and Culture Commission, um, I am pleased to uh, seek the appointments, and in one case, a reappointment, of Eric Anderson, Alicia Dynamic, Tanya Sloan, or Tina Sloan, and Sky Snyder. All right. Did you get all those, Madam Clerk? Yes, thank you. Okay, thank you. So that's a motion. Do we have a second? Second. All right, we have a second from Council Member Taylor. Uh, motion for the four appointments. All right. Any discussion on those? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. We're going to move on to item H1, actually, and that is any city council comments, including announcements on city boards or commissions, and we'll start with Council Member Breckus. None. Mr. Martinez. Nothing None. Ms. Taylor. All right, Mr. Reese. Nothing. Thank you, Madam. All right, Ms. Ebert. Yeah, uh, just a quick announcement. Um, there's not a lot of people here, but um, tomorrow we're having another senior cooking class at the Reno Elks from 11 to 2 with uh, Chef Chapin. So hope people can come out. Yeah, how cool was that? Yeah, so cool. It was great. Great yeah. time. Really neat. Yeah, if you guys want to come, 11 to 2. Um, just a quick announcement for me. I was very grateful for the assistance of Public Works Department. Um, we uh, saw an issue brought to our attention by Coral Academy over on Neal Road across from Home Depot where they have two schools, one an elementary school and a high school, and they had tremendous problems with uh, speeding cars during school, the 15 mile hour zone, 15 mile an hour zone, and uh, our staff were able to both apply for grants and to find some, some uh, capital funds to install some blinkers, some overhead, and this, we had a, a fantastic get together on Friday to celebrate this opening. Um, they've already reported a tremendous decrease in speeding cars, it's amazing. The cars were literally going between 35 and 55 during the 15 hour, so 35 and 55. The very first time I saw it, I had to immediately call our Reno Police Department who came right out with a motor and started pulling people over. It was so dangerous. Um, one of the parents had almost been hit in a crossing guard, et cetera. So it's a different world now and I'm, I'm so incredibly grateful for our public work staff and the work that they do. Okay, well that's it for me and I don't know if Mayor Sheevy's online, if she had anything to share with us. Uh, Mayor Sheevy is not present, but thank okay. you for checking. All right, thank you. All right, well, with that, we'll move on to the public hearing. I apologize. Oh. Just for the record, Mayor Sheevy is online. Okay. All right. Um, okay. Well, we'll move on to item I-1, the staff report uh, on this appeal. And uh, I want to turn to the um, city attorney's office to read whatever you need to read. Um, this is not an ordinance introduction, so okay. I don't need to read it. If you'd like me to read it, I would be happy to No, read it. I can do it. I just wanted to make sure, since it does have a case number and all. Yep. Um, so what we're going to do is open the public hearing. Um, let the record reflect that council's open a public hearing on item I-1. Um, and I want to confirm, Madam Clerk, uh, was proper notice given and a correspondence received? Vice Mayor Dewar, proper notice was given. We did receive correspondence on this item as um, 
we have a total of five, one letter of support of the appeal, so denial of the application, three letters of opposition of the appeal, so approval of the application, and one letter of concern. Those have been distributed to the Reno City Council. Okay. And let me ask now, are there any council disclosures? And I'll start with, uh, well, I won't start. Just does anyone want to raise their hand? Anyone have a disclosure? I don't see any. Okay. Um, and then we're moving on to the staff for staff presentations. Fill us in.
okay? Yeah. Yeah, great. Let me see <clears throat> if there's any questions for you at this time. Ms. Breckis? Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. So the use is a bar, correct? Um, and the live um, entertainment request would then, if approved, be um, approval they need to get a cabaret license, correct? Correct, and they already do have a cabaret license. Those hours, okay, so it allow it is directly related to the cabaret license, and it can't be adult cabaret, correct? Do they have a stage, or does this ax throwing, is that integrated with the performance that goes on in the facility, or is it just more like we see with mus live music or something? My understanding is that the axe throwing will appear on the upper floors. There is some the, the basement, and the basement is the primary place for the, um, for the live entertainment. And okay. if there is a stage, I don't think it's going to be. Okay. I can, I can ask yeah. them when they come up, yes. but the 24 hour operation, this ax activity, whatever that is, um, I would presume it's like an indoor amusement game sort of thing under your classifications. Correct, yes. That is allowed to be 24 hour. Yes. And that, this entertainment cabaret is not integrated into that? No. Okay, okay, so it's background. Yes. You know, okay. Okay, so there's that. And then the other question, um, which I would like a little more um, detail on, is you say there's other um, extended uses within the vicinity for um, extended cabaret or uh, live entertainment. What are those and where are those? Can you show me on the map and what, and what, what those are? I mean, obviously I know that the casinos all have live cabaret um, and live entertainment, but that predates the zoning ordinance from, you know, time immemorial. So what are the other ones that are allowed? Do you, do you know? I'm gonna bring up the map to see if I have them pictured. Um, I do believe that the shelter the shelter. Which, sorry, it's, it was originally the shelter. It's the arch, but now will be, so the one across, immediately across from Sydney Hall. Okay. Has similar um, hours of operations restrictions, um, as well as the Trocadero, which was the Faces NV. I don't think I have an image of a, a map of it. I apologize, but um, this is on 2nd Street in the El Cortez. Okay. So that one does have okay. this similar hour. Okay, so it's probably bar. two bars in the vicinity, not holding unlimited gaming, that do have these 24 hours, um, you know, were granted at some point, presumably, through a process like this one. Yes, and other, there are uh, many other nightclub and live entertainment uses in the area. They just don't have, they might actually be just 24 hours or not limited. But so not having cabaret, yeah. Yeah, because the zone allows 24 for the bar. The ones I'm referring to are ones that, that predated the requirements for, um, not the cabaret license, I'm not referring to the cabaret license, but specifically the hours of operation restrictions that, that came. So the library is one that I believe does not have any restrictions on time. Um, but there, we're there's, gonna... uh, there's others in the area. This is, we're trying to match the restrictions that we've been applying recently though. If I could, we're in a 24 hour zone, correct? Right. So, so you know, 24 hour, well, I'm trying to narrow it down to, um, you know, and we've changed ordinance over time, 24 hour for that added live entertainment because in my history, which is long <laughs> in this zoning code, um, you know, the 24 hour of the bars, not the casinos, was really for off shift workers coming and, you know, having a drink whenever, you know, they get off shift. That live entertainment came in as a discretionary thing because that was not a long standing thing. But you've told me at least of two others. So thank you. you okay. Know. Okay. I get that. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd uh, like to ask a question to our staff? Mr. Martinez? Thanks so much, Madam Vice Mayor. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Um, how long has Reno X been in business at the location? About five years. Four or five years. Four or five yeah. years. Do you know how many calls for service have been uh, called there over that time? So I'm not aware of the uh, over the time the full time frame. Yeah. Um, I can speak. I just got this information recently that in the, in the last few months there's only been about four in the area, but none of them are able to be tied to Reno X specifically. 
that was indicated by the police department. Okay, just somewhere within that vicinity is what you're referring to. Okay, and then I know you mentioned some of the businesses, but do you know if there are others, maybe like Silver Peak or Blight and Dock Tavern, that have an approved uh, conditional use permit like this? Not for extended hours, and as I noted, the live entertainment is allowed by right, so that they're, you're able to establish cabaret mm -hmm. um, within, uh, within certain hours up to the 11 p.m. mark. So the ones you mentioned, there is not, um, but there are others in the area, like I noted, like the, um, what was Trocadero, what yeah. was Faces Envy, that's, that was probably the more, most recent one that was approved. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, anyone else? Ms. Siebert, nothing? I have a question for you. Um, on, uh, in the staff report and in the attached materials, it mentions the need for a, um, it's called a security plan. I guess? Correct, yes. And um, when is it expected? It, it sounds like it may not have been submitted. Maybe it was recently submitted. When is it, has it been submitted or is it expected to be submitted soon? So we haven't um, accepted it yet, but it, it would be required prior to the operation of that, okay. that extended period. So if they didn't start for two months, they wouldn't have to apply the, uh, supply the security plan for two months? Correct, yeah. It wouldn't be required. Unless and then they... did I read something that it had to be some kind of special um, operations had to be in place for like 10 days before the cabaret began. I um, read something in here about uh, shall be in operation for 10 days prior to, let me find the condition. Um, let's see. Maybe it was in the planning commission part. Okay. So you don't recall that I'm not finding it, but I think. And maybe, maybe I don't. I'm not fully understanding the. Uh... It said that. It said that. It seemed like extra special security had to be in place Hi. ten days before the operation began, like the cabaret. Oh, um, there. I'm, I'm not actually aware okay. of that. Okay. Well, I'll I'm... look for it and I'll find it for later. Okay. Um, all right. Anyone else have any more questions? Mr. Reese? No, thank you. Okay. All right. Well, it looks like that's all the questions we have for you now. And then we'll turn it over to the applicant. Is that right? Or the appellant. The appellant. Okay. Um, you will have uh, 15 minutes to prove. What's that? Last time I did 10, but I was corrected that it was 15. So anyway, you will have up to 15 minutes uh, to do your, express your concerns. Uh, thank you, okay. uh, Madam Vice Mayor and Council Members. Uh, my name is Morton Hommy, M-O-R-T-E-N-H-O-M-M-E. I live at 50 North Sierra Street, Unit 703, which faces Sierra Street. Before getting into the details of uh, the appeal, I would like to say that uh, Phil with Reno Axe and Carter Williams, the Assistant Planning Commissioner, have been a, a pleasure to work with as we attempt to resolve some of the conflicting issues. Uh, we both basically want reactive police response when we need them. And most importantly, with Reno X and the Palladio residents, we want to be good neighbors to one another. And I know Carter Williams has been working over the last month to initiate meaningful discussions with the Reno Police Department. And I did get to have an opportunity to speak with Sergeant Hodges today regarding some of these issues. The residents' concerns are due to the eight-year experience with the Stick Sports Bar that's directly across from the Palladio, approximately 76, away, 76 feet away from our building. And that's not to say the Reno Acts will result in the same experiences, uh, but it is out of the lived experiences um, that our concerns are based that you'll be hearing I, I'm speaking to today. Plus, it looks like the Sticks is coming back now as the Dubs Sports Lounge, according to the marquee on the front of their building. So anyway, I purchased my home in 2010, 14 years ago. I found it. A lot of good changes have and are occurring in, occurring in downtown Reno. Reno Reimagine Reno Master Plan is working for a vibrant, high quality, life living experience envisioned in that plan. When I purchased my home, the area around the Palladio was a quiet neighborhood at night. Most businesses closed by 11 p.m. and residents my, like myself could get a good night's sleep. Uh, 
I understand the Palladio plan documents at the time also stated the surrounding area would be quiet at nights. The chocolate bar, which was located directly across the street at that time, closed at 11 p.m., which was then later reopened as the Sticks around 2016, and it also closed at 11 p.m. This changed around 2017 when the Sticks then started um, live entertainment events and closing around 3 a.m. The area around the Palladio was no longer quiet at nights and has resulted in an eight-year nightmare of disturbing the peace, the sleep and peace of myself and other residents. When I purchased my home in downtown Reno, the Reno Police Department had a downtown Reno office with officers that foot patrolled the area. That office and those officers at some point were closed and removed. The Downtown Reno Partnership was established in 2018, approximately, with ambassadors to assist downtown issues, funded by tax assessments of downtown Reno residents and businesses. One of the stated benefits in voting for the assessment uh, was downtown Reno would have additional police. I'm appealing the Reno City Act Standing Commission approval of case number LDC 24-0029, the Reno RACS. The Planning Commission approved um, as submit the, the, the staff report as, as submitted uh, by the Planning Commission. In that approval, a condition use permit, as was discussed, is required if live entertainment is to concur between 11 p.m. and 10 a.m. The Reno Acts was granted the conditional use permit to provide let, live entertainment Thursday, Friday, Saturday, 10 a.m. until 3 a.m. For the past year, eight years, I and other residents have been repeatedly awoken from our sleep at night by intoxicated, disorderly, loud patrons shouting, screaming, sometimes happy, sometimes sad, sometimes angry, coupled with verbal and physical altercations on many occasions. This typically started Thursday, college night, Friday, and then Saturday, starting about 12.30 a.m. and continued on till 3 or 3.30 a.m. Uh, these were patrons from the Sticks Bar, as I, I, as I could observe them from and, and hear them from my closed windows my, of my residential condominium unit. The Sticks Bar is now closed, but the Planning Commission has granted approval for Reno Acts located nearly <coughs> adjacent to the Palladio, less approximately 96 away, but approximately 100 feet, uh, with similar activity use and hours of operation. The Dub Sports Lounge is now replacing the Sticks Bar from what it looks like, and it may likewise request an all-night live entertainment use permit located directly across the street from the Palladio. The Palladio may soon have two all-night live entertainment events located with 100 feet of the Palladio condominium. In the, in the Riverwalk District, we have many bars that are located, including some there in the Palladio itself. And a bar operated at nighttime is not the issue. We want those bars to be successful. The issue arises when live entertainment is marketed to a new group and crowd of people. Um, security work alone do not solve the problem. When unruly pa uh, patrons, usually well intoxicated, are evicted from the premises, premises, it mitigates the problem inside the establishment, but now pushes the problem outside onto the public where residents living nearby must contend with. I've repeatedly been woken from my sleep and kept awake as the behavior continues unabated without intervention. Most importantly, in speaking with Sergeant Hedges, Hedges or Hodges, I'm not sure, I, please forgive me, of the Reno Police Department today, he, he, he verified disturbing the peace calls will be low priority level three and responded to if and when time allows, which in my experience has been 45 minutes to an hour before you get a call back. And then they typically will send a car if one is available, which usually shows up about 20 minutes after that. So after the disturbance has occurred, it is typically about an hour and a half before there's any response to the, to the event occurring. And usually by the time they do respond, it's over by that time and it's moved on. But it may have continued for 20, 30, 45 minutes, who knows. So bottom line, timely police inter intervention is not likely for drunken disorderly conduct, which would pro provide relief for residents living in downtown Reno. The harms done, be done 
to me by permitting live entertainment 11 p.m. to 3 a.m. with no timely intervention of disturbances harms me from lack of enjoying a good night's sleep, interrupts needed sleep patterns, prevents me getting the necessary sleep hours, resulting in lack of alertness, slower response times, and overall risk to my personal safety, safety and the safety of others. Repeated noise disturbances and the lack of timely interventions lowers my property values and makes the option of renting it difficult. I had renters move out due to the noise. Individuals are less likely to pay rent or purchase in high-end residential buildings like the Palladio with frequent noise disturbances and related activity outside their doors and windows. Realtors know about these issues and fully inform their clients including the shooting that occurred at the Styx Sports Bar last fall. Again last fall, I was awoken from my sleep. I heard the commotion. I watched for, four, for probably five minutes this, this argument, and I didn't call 911 because I've been scolded not to do that. I had to call the non-emergency number, and I know I don't get response for 45 minutes to an hour and then and longer for a response. So I simply watched this argument con continue on until the guy pulled out the gun, and shoots. Luckily, there were plenty of other people around that area that did not get hurt. But it's very difficult when there's no response, when something like this is occurring. occurring. Did you call 911 then, when that yes. happened? Okay. Yes, and I was interviewed. Good. Yeah. I and other residents living in the area submitted 15 public comments in opposition, as well as seven speaking against the requested use permit at the Planning Commission hearing February 7th, 2024, addressing these issues and included in the report that I submitted. The Planning Commission report correctly identifies the key issue of noise compatibility with the Palladio residential condominium and other nearby condominiums. The report has taken steps to implement conditions to mitigate noise compatibility by requiring conditional use permit required conditions. Many of those conditions will be helpful. Although the Planning Commission report states, page four, based on the recommended conditions and existing code requirements, staff finds the public concerns are mitigated. Are mitigated. I and others disagree. The conditional use permit approved by the Planning Commission states required conditions including items 12 and 14 of the planning staff report. Item 12 condition specifies the applicant shall provide a security plan that would be subject to the satisfaction of the Zoning Administrator, Code Enforcement Department, and Reno Police Department reviewed by the Administrator. No plan has been submitted, reviewed, or accepted. Noise compatibility with residents has not been mitigated until an acceptable plan addresses and significantly reduces disturbing the peace noise issues of residents living nearby. Item 14 conditions require hired security workers patrol to alleviate police problems, excessive noise, abusive behavior, disturbances, and any other violation of law on or about the licensed premises. Security workers do not have the legal authority to enforce law or code violations. They can only patrol and monitor. In discussions with Reno Racks, they do not agree to patrol the area, only the area directly in front of their building, and I understand why. The Reno Police Department trained officers are required to patrol the area and enforce the law. No conditions in the Planning Commission staff report specify timely response to disturbances in item 14 of the report. Without timely intervention, when requested by myself or other residences, there is no mitigation of noise compatibility. The question remaining is, how will the city mitigate the noise incompatibility of intoxicated, disruptive, loud patrons screaming, yelling, and shouting on public sidewalks and street from late night live events permitted with residents needing to sleep within 100 feet of that event? The Reno PD will not be able to respond 
quickly to non-emergency calls such as disturbing the peace. I listed some release and, and, and suggestive actions and I've modified those slightly and I'll go over them today. Number one would, would simply be do not approve live entertainment between the hours of, light, of 11 p.m. and 6 a.m. or 10 a.m. when located within 500 feet or a set distance, whatever you think would be appropriate, of residential properties until timely noise issues are mitigated. A second possibility would be that we require the Reno Acts to hire an off-duty police officer to mitigate noise disturbances during live entertainment past 11 p.m. until approximately 30 minutes past closing. Or number three, limit live entertainment to Friday and Saturdays as a compromise but what I learned recently is that the ambassadors now have an all night team of four individuals that patrol the area in a vehicle. And they're also looking into establishing security ambassadors. So just like you go to the doctor, you may not see the doctor, you may see a nurse practitioner. I think possibly the ambassadors could be a possible solution to the dilemma that, that we face here of how do, you meet, how do you meet timely response to uh, handle noise disturbances. So the next possibility would be to enlist ambassadors and, and or security ambassadors when they get spooled up to be on call to respond immediately within reason to residents disturbing the peace calls with police backup when they need. I thank you very much for your time and I thank the city for having the opportunity and the process to appeal this, and thank you for the work that you've done on reimagined Reno downtown. Okay. It, it is happening, and thank you for what you're doing for Reno. All right, sir, and thank you. And we brought some water up there for you in case you're interested. There's a bottle. Thank you. Okay. Um, let me ask, um, I think it'd be appropriate to ask the council if we have any questions of the appellant. No, I would like to... Um here at the, the respondent. Yeah, okay. Before we start asking any questions. Yeah, we already asked questions of staff. And then um, I'm going to want to ask a couple questions of Chief Finance when we're finished. Right. Yeah, okay. So let's bring up the uh, respondent. And you also have 15 minutes. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Alex. This is Phil. We represent Reno X. Great. Welcome. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you guys, and good to see you again. <laughs> okay. Tonight, we're going to be going over an overview of our existing business. What is doing that? I know. Do you know, Madam Clerk? It's sort of been doing this off and on. That's okay. It's like crackling. <laughs> We're going to be going an overview of what our existing business operations are, and we'll talk about what we plan to do with this new permit. We'll address stakeholder concerns, and then we'll wrap it up with a nice conclusion. All right, so first, kind of who are we? Uh, so like I said, we're Reno Axe. We're located on 100 North Sierra Street. We are primarily an indoor axe throwing facility. We've been in business for coming up on five years. Um, in addition to axe throwing, we have two bars, one located on the street level as well as one located in the basement. And the one in the basement is what we'll be doing the most discussion of about tonight. These two bars currently operate until 1 a.m., Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. In an average year, we're serving just over 75,000 customers, and we currently employ over 25 employees. On an average weekend night, we're employing six security guards, all of whom who have previously worked in high volume bars, at least two years of experience in what I would categorize as a bar that is busier than ours. We pride ourselves on being the best and the most secure bar in downtown thanks to the uh, meticulous management of my team as well as the security team. That is evidenced by the fact that we have a 100% uh, pass rate with police stings. We are completely in compliance with city requirements. Um, we are always incredibly prepared during um, crawls. We have AAT cards on file. We want to make sure that everything is operating successfully and safely. Oh, mine's not working. All right, uh, we're currently known as a pre-party bar. What that means is that we get the most uh, customers before 11 o'clock. The goal of this particular uh, process is to hold on to the customers that we already have. 
because we're noticing a natural decline in sales around 10, and, uh, 10 p.m. and 11 p.m. And it's because these people are going to other late night locations. These uh, are usually close to us. There's our bar up the street. And I have actually a list of bars that operate later than we do, which we'll get into later. But most of these people are just kind of wandering the street, figuring out what's next. Our intention is to remain busy for another couple of hours so that we can hold on to those people and give them something to do. And plus it's a win for us because we can hold on to and gain a little bit more revenue during that time. This picture on the uh, slide here shows the downstairs bar, the basement, and where this change is taking place. So. We received feedback that operating all night long until 10 a.m. was not desirable. And in fact, on the original request, it had us operating until 10 a.m. We have heard that feedback and we're willing to bring it down to 3 a.m. And that is going to be on Fridays and Saturdays. Uh, we do uh, request the ability to do it on Thursdays as a business need only. So like if a New Year's falls on a Thursday or there's a business play in mind, we will use a Thursday. But for most of the time, we don't plan on actually going late on Thursday nights. It would just be these Friday and Saturday evenings. Noise is another concern. Um, so we have done our own sound tests and we have found that we are well within the 65 decibel range outside. All of this new entertainment is done in the basement. We have almost blown our speakers downstairs trying to get a noise level above 65 on the street, but we can't do it. Everything, like even just putting my head next to the door of social, that basement entry door, I can't hear any, anything above 65. So we're confident that noise is not going to be an issue from the amplified music. Um, in our NAB meeting, a Ward 5 member asked us what kind of music we're going to be playing because they were concerned about certain types of music impacting customer behavior more than others. We're not planning on changing what's in our DNA currently. We're going to keep playing what's been working, which is typically your top 40. It's light. It's upbeat. People are having a good time. We don't plan on catering to aggressive music at all. All right, drunk people and noise. So again, the feedback here is that drunk people are wandering onto the streets and they're creating a nuisance. Um, we, it is our belief that operating later, we can capture some of these unruly patrons within our premises for longer. So we put our heads together and we came up with a few different reasons on why people might be going from bar to bar, or at least on the street drunk with nowhere to go. Uh, one of those is going to another bar. Like I said, downtown Reno has a litany of bars in the area, all within walking distance of where we are. Another one is that they might be walking back to an apartment or housing complex that's downtown. A third and less likely is that they're just being deliberately loud with no reason, or they're going to get something to eat. So we want to help tackle these problems, and we think by staying open later, we can have people that are in our facility, and then when they're ready to leave, they're usually just going home at that point. The next concern we had was about increased capacity. Um, we don't plan on increasing capacity. We don't foresee DJs or live entertainment having an impact to our capacity. Um, our busiest nights are uh, pub crawls. Um, those are a large part of downtown. Uh, all the bars participate, but we don't see capacity numbers, and this would be you know, where we have a line outside the door, except for crawls, and we don't foresee a DJ having an impact on that. Cameras and recording, we already have cameras in place that record for up to seven days at a time. They all have infrared capability, and we have cooperated with all police asks whenever they come up. <clears throat> Egress and fire safety, we totally get it, and we agree. Um, we will um, always comply with what the fire department and other departments um, deem as safe, um, and we will uh, submit whatever is appropriate to the stakeholders of the city. And this includes emergency exit paths, evacuation plans, all of it. Age limit, um, the downstairs bar is already uh, 21 and over. And we stop allowing uh, under 21 at 10 o'clock. And they would only be permitted in the upstairs axe throwing facility. So uh, we're already in compliance here on this one. And in fact, um, the security team that I have in place has taken hundreds of fake IDs off of the streets. Um, we. We really want to do our part, and being a good neighbor, we want to do our part in making sure that we're only catering to people that are able to imbibe. And uh, as a result of that, we have taken a lot of fake IDs. Uh, our security plan. Uh, it was mentioned a couple times um, that we have to provide a security plan, and we're 100% able to do that, and we are happy to comply. Uh, and so whatever RPD, zoning enforcement, whatever you guys need to do, we are happy to submit. 
Security, so um, there was a stipulation stating that we will have to staff one security per 50 people. Now this is a large ask for us from a payroll perspective, but we're happy to do it. So we're gonna meet in the middle here and we are happy to bring on one security per 50 people. As is, we have six security on staff on Saturday nights. If we were going to meet this requirement, we would only bring bringing on two extra security on Fridays and Saturdays. But I've already started interviews for them and so we're ready to go if and when is necessary. Queuing plan, uh, we agreed to provide a business queuing plan and in fact we've been operating with a queuing plan for every crawl. Um, it is typically approved in advance and we've always passed uh, city <coughs> compliance inspections when they come by on crawls. Uh, sidewalk and curbs, we completely agree. The sidewalk and curbs should be maintained in a good and safe condition. Uh, we also monitor for trash and we uh, other nuisances. Um, Mort mentioned that um, the downtown ambassadors have a late night uh, team, and we have called them on numerous occasions to help us with homeless or anything else that we see in the area. All right. Uh, like I mentioned earlier on, we truly have one of the best security teams in downtown Reno, and that is absolutely evidenced by the fact that we have a perfect sting and city compliance record. Our, our customers have routinely thanked us for our work um, and that they feel safe in our environment. We are only asking to operate for an additional two hours, two nights all of the week, with a potential for Thursdays if there is a business need, but again, we do not foresee needing it all the time. And I think I addressed all of this already. Thank you. All right, um, so to answer your question earlier on about other bars in the area, it's that second paragraph there. Uh, so within walking distance of Reno Axe, there are this list, or there, <laughs> these bars are right next to us. There is Novi, The Wall, Tonic, Brew House, West 2nd Street, Eden, our bar, I mean the list goes on. Uh, I can tell you that at least half of those bars are currently operating with live entertainment beyond 3 a.m. and they are within walking distance of Reno Axe. Most notably is West 2nd Street, who operates uh, live entertainment almost seven days a week, late night. So um, again, Reno Axe operating for an extra two hours, two to potentially three nights a week, um, will help us reduce foot traffic in the area. I'm hopeful that it will help reduce um, noise concerns in the area because they're gonna be staying at our bar and then going home after that. Um, I don't know many people that typically stay out past three or 4 a.m. anyway. You have anything? No, I'm ready to answer any questions you guys may have. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, at this time I'm going to ask Chief Nance if you would come to the dais. Thanks so much. Hi. Hi, everybody. Maybe you can explain a little bit uh, what your process is once you get a call for a disturbance, um, and do you treat it any different? downtown than you would any other part of the city. Yeah. Give us a little bit of background there um, because I think Mr. Morton mentioned a couple of times. Understood. We um, So we're really working on changing some of uh, how people report things, what the response to that is, and then that follow-up piece. And so when I got here, I found that a lot of times when people were calling in to report things that maybe we couldn't go to right away, either um, we weren't, uh, we weren't a, getting that call and looking at it and we weren't receiving information on who to recontact back. So we've done some education and we've done some stuff downtown with different residences and um, apartment buildings that down there to talk about how the best way to report crimes is and incidents that are happening. And I think the, what I wanna stress the most is um, yes, sometimes you call for something and it isn't as high of a priority call as something else that's happening in the city. And so resources are deployed uh, based on the priority and the needs that are happening right then. If somebody's available, we'll take the lower priority calls right away. If there's an incident or a problem happening that we can't respond to right away, um, we'll take the call and then we still have that documentation purposes for later. And that's really big in a lot of these things. Um, with restaurants, bars, problem uh, locations. One of the things that ends up happening is uh, when we get there, the problem usually isn't happening anymore. The people have left, they've been concerned, they've been ran off by um, whoever's out there, whether it's ambassador, security, um, neighbors. At that point in time, there might not be anything for us to do when we get there. Um, 
in these types of incidences, generally there's not. And sometimes that's a delayed response. And sometimes it's because people realize people are calling the police and they just want to leave. But those calls for service help us and determine what problem locations are. And I can talk to you a little bit about that and what we do with problem locations also, if you want me to move into that or I can stop. Okay. Totally up to you. <laughs> okay. I think I said a lot. I'm not sure. <laughs> Let me just ask you, um, how long, because I know it's been fairly recently that the ambassadors have deployed their night team. Um, how long has that been in place now? Do you know? I think it's only been about a month, yeah, maybe a month very, and a half. It's been fairly yeah. new. It could be a little bit longer than that. Um, but they're working on what that looks like. And they're also looking at a different security model. We're also in the process of um, continuously reevaluating how we deploy resources also. And so we're also looking at how does that all night ambassador model impact what we do? How does their security team impact what we do? And how do we still continue to provide resources? Okay. Yeah, I knew it was um, fairly recent. So I, I think, too, that it sort of evolves um, because it is a little bit of a different model than Absolutely. they've been used to. Um, and then also, is there coordination between, I assume that there is, because sometimes, you know, you guys are on some pretty serious calls and, you know, I understand noise disturbance might be a little bit lower. So is there some coordination between the ambassadors and the police department? So we do coordinate with them. We have weekly meetings and weekly touch, touch, we touch base with um, the DRP officials and different people in that group along with Clean and Safe on a weekly basis to discuss problem areas, hotspots, and things like that. We also have weekly meetings with code enforcement um, and meet regularly with business licensing to say where are you seeing the complaints also to make sure that we're all putting our efforts into that same space. Okay. All right, thank you so much. All right, I'm gonna send it to Councilwoman Doerr. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chief Nance. Chief Nance, um, I have a question. So we do we have a downtown patrol? We do. So we have several different options for downtown patrol and what that looks like. So we have regularly assigned beat officers and we average six or seven officers in the central district. The central district is the smallest district of the police department. It pretty much just incorporates downtown. It goes a little farther south maybe than downtown. Um, and then kind of the east-west borders that you would think of in that area. And it's the smallest area. These folks are on uh, the bikes? Uh, we, so is that... this is just our patrol officers. So these are standard patrol officers oh. that respond to call for service. Um, on every shift, we have either six or seven assigned okay. to that downtown area. And I just wanted to make sure that we we're clear that that's smaller. In addition to that, we have, um, during the day primarily, we have our community action officers that are, uh, that, deploy downtown at least daily. Sometimes they go to other areas and they, they are in other areas depending on complaints that we get there, but they're always downtown daily. So that's during the day. Then the other team that I think you're speaking of is going to be our downtown enforcement team. That is a bike team. And they work Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And they work from two to midnight. Um, and after looking at the research on when the best time to deploy them was, that was what we were given based on calls for service and that type of nature. So they're out there when it's getting dark and everything else. We are in the process of reevaluating deployment, like I said, and so those hours might change as we move through that. They're primarily assigned to the business improvement district. So not quite all of Central, but the business improvement district. But but this bar, this area, this AC, Reno Axe is in the downtown. That's correct. Yes. Right. In the some in the bit. Yes. Okay. So and I those guess those officers. I'm sorry. Those officers, the downtown enforcement team, they are specifically assigned to the bid. They do not leave unless there is a major emergency, like a life threat, right. anything that they have to leave for. These five officers. Five officers, one sergeant. Yes. During two in the afternoon till midnight. That's correct. Okay. So they should be right around there. Yes. And so they're not going to respond to probably a car crash or something because you got six or seven officers in cars, right? They might, but it just depends on where they're at and their okay. availability. But it seems, I mean, it does seem like there is a presence and it seems like there might be an opportunity to respond. And maybe as you're moving through evaluating your first full year here, maybe that's something to take a peek at, you know, is oh. are they responding? And also if they're calling the non-emergency number, is the non-emergency information getting over to the officers quickly, or do they hold that for an hour and then every third, you know, hour or so send out new information? I just don't know how it works. Um, 
Um, the calls for service would immediately put be put on the screen. They'd be put in a queue to respond to ah. at some point in time. So what happens with the canceling of calls? So if it's a lower priority call, sergeants and watch commanders are responsible for evaluating uh, what those calls look like. And if we have the capability of responding or not, if we don't have the capability, one of the things that we're directing the sergeants and the watch commanders to do that wasn't done before is to call the person that's the reporting party back. Oh. So if they do leave their name and number and we can return their call and explain why we're not responding, wow. we're working on making sure that they know that why they didn't come out there. Because that was something that was just kind of left in the ether. Nobody knew why the police, or if they did show up or didn't show up. And so we're really working on that. That is impressive. I mean, the communication piece is so important. Uh, just most people are so relieved just to get any validation back that their call was heard and is in a queue and that we're aware things are happening. I mean, I think that's a great improvement. Thank and then you. And it's just telling people why we can't go. Right. It's not because we don't want to or we just don't have resources. We actually are very specific that there was a shooting or a homicide or another incident so that they understand why we couldn't respond there at I that like time. I like it. I like it. All right. Any further questions? I have a question for Mr. Williams. Go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Chief. So um, the applicants did show a list of, you know, bars in the area, and I think there's, you know, some separation here because we know bars can operate. So could a massage parlor or, you know, a, a Walgreens. But the live entertainment's the different component, and the one in very close proximity. So this is a doubling of that in proximity to this very fine grain area. Um, where the you know residential uses is, is this one called I think called the sticks or the arch it, and that's basically right across the street correct that is that is correct yes and is that now an active use the the stick closed the um, stick and there, closed yes and there is a new bar with the live entertainment component going in there uh -huh. um, so but when that, did the stick close. I'm not, I'm not sure. It was recent, uh, though, within the last six months, six months to a year. Okay, because now let's be clear, because proliferation is an issue, and, you know, while I think this is an operator has a good track record and made a convincing argument, um, it's the contextual that's really important. So having two of these in real close proximity, I think, doubles it up. And the code says... And, and I, if I recall, I did not support that one over there, okay, when it came through. I think it came to a hearing just like this, and I think there was concern about the fine grain nature of it to residential. But that one, if, if no one fills that and comes in and licenses for cabaret, when does that special conditional use permit get wiped out? How many months? So the, it, it would have gone... Um Actually, I think that one in particular did not have an, an amortization or a end date to that one. Uh, so, but something that is, I think, important with that one specifically is that one of the conditions allows us to go back in and apply to conditions where we see that there are issues. So we're, we likely will be applying the same conditions we're applying to Reno Acts to that one to mitigate some of those issues that have been represented in the past. Well, it may just be a proliferation issue. You know, I think one in every, you know, four down, four block area is the way to go, you know, and keeps it, tamps it down a little bit. You know, I could say, make that argument. So uh, I thought the code said if you don't continuously maintain your conditional use permit for 18 months, it it expires. Normally we represent that in a condition. That is absolutely in the code, just to be clear. Yeah. But um, that one, so, I think that we determined that that one was maybe maybe done prior to that being in code, and we didn't implement a condition. I'm not, I'm not I won't, I, there were some issues, I yeah, know, with, with its expiration. Yeah, because here's the deal is, if that one's still out there, I'm, I'm having a hard time with this one. Okay, and that one is a signal to me that it's problematic because we're on the third operator over there now. Fourth. Um, fourth? Yes. Fourth operator. Okay, these these folks have probably been in business as long as everyone else over there on there, and they seem pretty good. But the fact that we got another one hanging out there is is problematic, making the area problematic for me. So I wish I had a yep. little more information from you on the status. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Uh, Councilwoman Taylor, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. My question is also part of a comment. Living downtown, I, I, I absolutely sympathize with what you're going through. However, 
we have these conditions of approval. And what I need to understand is how do, if the applicant is not meeting the conditions of, the, of approval, what is the recourse for the residents? Because we had a similar situation right on 2nd Street. Applicant came in, going to do all this stuff, and now we're having problems. And it's not necessarily with the establishment. I mean, you can't, but it's the people coming out of the street, loitering around in the things that they attract and the activities. So what can we do to ensure that these conditions are being adhered to? And I guess from a council position, I need to know what resources we need to allocate. So when we had our budget discussions, one of the things that I was really adamant about was having the bar car or and having some additional code enforcement so we could address these issues. Yes, so the, the conditions themselves are, are are implemented or enforced by our, our code enforcement team in coordination with our compliance officers. So, I mean, calling those complaints in to com um, our um, business license compliance as well as code enforcement um, will get the ball rolling for enforcement of but those. But do we have anybody that actually works between 12 and 4 in the morning? So there is a, uh, a program called uh, CSAS, and I apologize, I don't, I don't recall. And I've yet. heard of this, but, and I heard it's, you know, it, it happens once a quarter or something like that. We need to know how we get that going more and if we need it more. Yeah, and I can't necessarily speak to um, the capacity for code enforcement. Um, I might have to defer that to um, maybe Ashley. <laughs> or Chief Nance, actually. Thank you. I'll let Chief Nance and then fill in any blanks if we need to. Regarding can resource for CSAS, we can come back to that as well, Councilmember Taylor. Thank you. So I, just in case I didn't miss it, bar car uh, compliance and enforcement, is that kind of the question? Exactly, okay. and if that will help with some yep. of the things, I, I mean, I don't want to punish the business for the things that we need to be doing as a city to help help keep our city clean and safe and people need to sleep and people need to have entertainment. What, what do you guys need from us, especially now since we're talking about budget, to make these everybody live in peace, I guess? So we need, well, the first thing we need is we need to know that the problem is happening. And generally what happens is people get so frustrated then that they don't know, that by the time we get it, it's almost an emergency, if that makes sense. Like it's been going on for too long and we didn't really do enough about it in the beginning. So we really need to understand what the problems are in the beginning. So that's the letting business licensing know, let code enforcement know. Let the police department know right when you're starting to see the, the business and the establishment turn. Um, that allows us to start to pay attention to it. Um, there's a few bars that are um, kind of problem bars as of late and things that we have. So what we then do is we try to put all of our uh, teams together, business licensing, code enforcement. We use the fire department to make sure that they're not over capacity. Uh, we can use a health department and police department. And we go out as a group and we do bar inspections. We look to see how they're performing. We've also probably at that point in time um, identified a lot of other information. So by the time we get to that enforcement stage, we have a complete picture of what's going on there. It's not a one-off, it's a continual problem. So where people get frustrated sometimes is the fact that it does take us a little while to put those together. And if it's our, they're already frustrated because we weren't aware that it was really a problem before, now they're really frustrated because it takes a few weeks for us to compile some information, to, to look at the bars, to watch what's happening, to, to make sure that it's actually a problem and not a one-off of just a one neighbor complaint or something like that. But then the enforcement happens and then what that can do, and I can't really speak to this, but it can result in fines, it can result in loss of your business license, it can result in a lot of other things that um, the businesses don't want to have. And also generally the patrons don't want to go to the bar that the police are hanging out at either. So that kind of helps too. So mm -hmm. that's the other side of it. So that's the CSAS model, but there's a lot of steps that get us to there. Okay, thank you very much. All right, and Councilman Reese, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I have a question first for Mr. Williams, and it's really related to the nature of the conditional use permit process and what conditions can or cannot be placed on it. So the applicant, <laughs> um, Reno Axe, had said basically, hey, they were okay with Tuesday and Saturday, as I understood it. They were hoping for Thursday to be uh, if a major holiday lands on a Thursday. Um, is that correct as I understood it? 
Friday and Saturday, but yes. Uh, right. Yeah. But and then, Friday and Saturday, they've agreed they want to have the longer hours. Correct. Thursday, they want to do it only if, say, New Year's Eve falls on a Thursday. That's right. That's being communicated, yes. Yeah. And so I want to understand um, from the process standpoint for how we look at conditions when we place conditions on it. Uh, certainly, there are lots of holidays that could fall on a Wednesday. It could be Cinco de Mayo. It could be a Tuesday, and we're celebrating some other thing. I want to make sure that we allow the bar the flexibility to have those decisions made on a sort of what is a business's need as opposed to some other artificial constraint. So do we do that anywhere else in the city, or how does that work? So through um, what are called special activity permits, we are able to do... Um, one-offs. One-offs, yeah, okay. up to six times a year. So okay, so I appreciate that, and that makes my answer fairly easy. Look, I've... Uh, and uh, thank you, Mr. Williams, that's all I have for you. Um, for the applicant, Reno Axe. So I have had the opportunity to visit Reno Axe a number of times. It's a great bar, great opportunity. Um, I'm not very good at throwing axes. I've realized it actually requires quite a bit of strength and skill to do it well, uh, but it seems like a fun thing. Um, my hope is that you all will continue to be good neighbors, um, doing your best to make sure that your patrons are having a great and fun and safe time, but that when they leave there, they're not you know, racing out tonight and causing havoc on your neighborhood. Um, I'm um, convinced that you've made a good presentation. Your uh, business model is a good one. So I'll be supporting your efforts in this regard. But continue to lean into what the neighbors are telling you because you know, certainly they would be your customer base too. I mean, at some point in time and, and perhaps maybe not as frequently as they might like, but uh, they also have the desire and right to live peaceably downtown as do you. So continue to do that. And, uh, you know, these are... Um, grants that we make here at the dais and we take them very seriously. So thank you. Thank you. All right, AC and Turney, you want to weigh in? Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, a few things back to Councilmember Taylor, your question before. Uh, the first thing, just to state for the record, is that CSEST is the Community Safety and Services team. As Chief Nance noted, this is a team that's comprised of multiple departments throughout the city as well as other agencies. Uh, currently, this functions as a team that goes out on an ad hoc basis. What I'm hearing from council could be a request for additional times. Uh, what would need to happen in order to support that would be allocated funds for overtime. As it sits right now, we do not have code enforcement officers or business license compliance officers that are working swing or graveyard shifts. And so that comes in as an overtime opportunity when we schedule these as a unit. Uh, one other thing I'd like to note, Madam Mayor, if I can, for the record, for residents and anyone else watching, if there are concerns with existing businesses, noise issues as it relates to businesses with SUPs, we always suggest that you put these complaints into Rito Direct. You can do this online at our website. Uh, this will allow us to be able to have that information on for lack of a better term, bad actors and folks who are not complying in those situations. And as Chief Nance mentioned, if those come in earlier and not when it's reached an inflection point, that helps staff to be able to start reviewing if there is a need for cause to pull or for revocation. Okay. All right. Any further questions from council members? Okay. Seeing that there are none, I'm going to bring it back to Madam Clerk. Do you have any public comment for the record? Thank you, Madam Mayor. We do have public comment from Robert Rabkin. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Mayor and, and City Councilman and women. Um, I am uh, an owner uh, over across the street at 50 North Sierra. I can speak from personal experience about the Styx Bar and what a wonderful thing it was when it closed. Um, I was at the original, I, I was at the previous hearing, the planning commission, and um, I was impressed that the, the Axe Bar, um, they seemed to be very uh, focused, responsible, and uh, they had, uh, they gave me the impression, I haven't been there as a customer or even inside, but I got the impression that they're that they have things under control. This isn't about. This has nothing to do with 
noise level and anything that's under the control of the bar. This is all about what's going on in the street and providing a, as it were, an attractive nuisance uh, to, uh, for uh, drawing people, uh, get, getting people who are raucous and uh, maybe uh, very, they're basically people uh, disturbing uh, the, the residents in, uh, in their homes um, between midnight and three. And I was, I was interested because Chief Nance mentioned that there are zero police assigned between midnight and three, and yet we're talking about having, uh, we're, we're talking about attracting people and, and then actually disgorging them between midnight and three. With with no um, with no ability on the basis on for, by the authorities uh, to police that security guards and so on fine I'm sure they keep order within but um, if there is a problem uh, people are going to be ejected it's not going to be the problem of of the acts and I so I think this is a bigger problem than just the acts I think the problem is. The, the streets need to be uh, maintained, order needs to be maintained in the streets. And if that requires, and I'm, I'm glad I didn't know any, I know anything about the budget process, but um, if this is the time, if there's money to pay for police uh, between 12 and three, because that's what we're talking about, then uh, they, there should be somebody, especially, in, and there was a question about communication between the, this group of um, the ambassadors, this night team. Well, uh, my understanding is the ambassadors are supposed to call the police if there's an issue. But um, basically, I would like to see some provision for maintaining order and quiet in the street. And that's, thank you very much for Great. your time. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. I appreciate your comments. All right, any other further questions? Go ahead, Councilwoman Doerr. Yeah, I think this last gentleman kind of put his finger on it, which it's not so much, uh, it seems like the bar is incredibly well managed. Uh, I haven't seen such a good presentation by any bar <laughs> owner. Isn't it true? Right? Um, <laughs> I know, it's like you've almost done this before. <laughs> well, and you have probably at the Planning Commission, but, um, you know, I really do think I, prior to this meeting, I had called Chief Nance and found out that her officers are, she mentioned two to midnight, to your point, and um, I am concerned about the after hours. Not just this. We we just had a list of about 15 bars that are open, yeah. and we're we're a, supposed to be a 24-hour city. That means we're operating not just grocery stores and bars, but uh, fire and police too, right? I mean, the 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 beat goes on. So I'm I'm um, inclined to approve the application, deny the appeal, but I'm also inclined to to really understand what we're doing downtown. If there's so many things, there's the team in the cars, there's the team in the bikes, there's the bid, the ambassadors. This is not a very big downtown. Like, how do they work together, communicate together, and make sure you know order and peace are maintained? So I think and that is a big question. Do you want to come up for a minute? Um, one of the things, too, downtown is going through a major revitalization. I was just in another bar down the street that's getting ready to open birdies. There's a lot that's sort of um, transpiring downtown. That's one of the reasons the ambassadors came in. I also, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, um, but, you know, what happens inside the bar is up to the business owner, correct? And once they get to the street level, that's our issue, correct? Yes. Okay. I wanted to make sure. And then um, because we've been going through this transformation, we've been, had a lot of discussion about this. I also believe that the way that we enforce and what we're doing um, is going to change, I think. Yes. Uh, so maybe you talk a little bit about that. Because I also want everyone to know here that um, because downtown is becoming um, you know, sort of the central hub uh, for entertainment and for residential. And then, you know, you get the two and, it, you know, it can be a little bit of a challenge. We've seen over there at um, the artist lofts, right? But I will say they are incredible owners, right? So they work with us and we have a great relationship. 
But, you know, at first, until you kind of get out the gate, you don't really know what to expect. The good news is, is that I have confidence in you guys that you're, you know, great operators. That makes a huge difference. But I think we do, um, as Councilwoman Taylor said, there's that level that we have a responsibility once people hit the street. I also think that it is changing because we know that downtown is becoming, um, it's very desirable. I don't care what anyone says. I mean, people can say what they want. Um, you know, there are some areas that are closed and casinos that, you know, may not be the thing of today that were the thing of the past, right? So it's changing dramatically. Give me an idea of what that kind of looks like, um, your future vision, because I know there's been a lot of talk with the ambassadors and the residents down there. So maybe give us an, an idea of what that looks like and maybe talk about your um, the time that the officers are uh, present. Yep, absolutely. So I don't want to give away too much, but I'm going to give a little bit because I am coming back. I don't know if everybody knows this in April, mid to late April, um, at one of the council meetings there to really give you an update on downtown, what we're doing with the deeds program, what the future of that looks like, and how we're redeploying some things. So I'll have a lot more information for you there, but I'll foreshadow the stuff I know I didn't want to give it away. I and know. I know you probably can't talk about it here, like but I want secret. everyone to know something is happening. <laughs> it is. And so. it's, it's very, very promising. So I want the residents yes. to know that there's... Um, Help on the way? Yes, stuff it, on the horizon. That is actually, it's really, really good, and it's successful in other cities. And It's great. And, yeah. you know, one of the things I want to say is that um, the officers from September to uh, February have done over 4,000 uh, self-initiated activities out there, so proactive police activities in just the downtown area in those four months. That's quite a lot. That's a, a, a big number compared to what we were doing before. So we are seeing an additional presence down there of the officers doing proactive work. And part of that is through the deeds, which is the directed engagement enforcement deployment strategy that we're utilizing downtown right now, really bringing in a lot of people from all, all the walks of the police department. Everybody's responsible for a place in that. So I'm going to have some updated, really good information for you then. But to clarify a couple things, we do have the downtown enforcement team, which is the bikes that's currently working and they work two to midnight. But 24 seven, there is staff downtown. We do not ever not have uniformed police personnel downtown. There's between six and seven officers per shift every single day. So the shifts run either day shift, they run two to midnight, or they run in the overnight hours from 10 on. And that's, what's, that's what our um, authorized strength, and that includes where there's also sergeants. And then we also have another team that is a team that roves around and does wherever the problem areas are. So if the problem areas are downtown on the, in the evening hours, they go there and they work from five at night to three in the morning. So there is always accessibility and people working. So I don't want to give the idea that we don't have police services downtown after midnight just because downtown enforcement team is not there. Um, th that coupled with, I'm, I'm sure the council remembers last budget cycle, we were authorized uh, five uh, additional officers and one supervisor. And we had a lot of conversations about how those are going to be deployed. They were not authorized personnel until January. We have hired those people at this point in time. They're going through the academy, but we did also, um, we're luck lucky enough to hire some laterals. We have people that are going to be a little more um, able to hit the streets starting sooner. And we're working on what that model, which is why I'm not exactly sure what it's going to look like. I have some ideas. But we're working on the details for how we're going to deploy them. And that's going to be a downtown team that will offset the uh, bike team that we have into a different time and space. And so um, we are also doing a redeployment uh, study right now. We hired a consultant that's doing a redistricting, a redist looking at our police districts and our staffing levels and deployment on patrol to give us a better idea of what that's going to look like. And so once I get those things, we get our downtown team going, I'm going to have a lot more information and there'll be a lot more resources. And I think that's going to change a lot of that outlook. But right now we do have people working all the time. So we're not waiting for those things to happen. We have them there currently. Mm -hmm. Okay. A lot of work happening. Yes, I know. Um, and I look forward to your presentation. And when are you doing that? In I, uh, April? Yeah. Thank you. I okay. knew it was the, like near the end of April, but I didn't know the date. Yeah. I'll okay. be back. All right. Good. Thank you. Thanks. All right. Any further questions? Seeing that there are none, I am going to send it to you, um, Councilwoman Taylor. I believe this is your district. It is. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I motion to affirm the Planning Commission's decision. Okay. I have a motion from Councilwoman Taylor. Do I have a second? 
Second. I have a second from Councilman Reese. Discussion? Councilman Breckis, go ahead. Yeah, I'm not gonna support the motion. Um, I, th I am impressed with the operator and their track record, but I feel that we need to look very fine grain. The code's set up for this and very specific in this area. And we have another operator who got in first, or a property owner who got in first. And I think the fine grain nature of this immediate vicinity poses too much we hour activity and you know potential problems um, not only to you know the residents in the area but also to our operations for response and so um, I'd like to support it and if the other one wasn't sitting out there I would support it and I am going to do investigation on my own. And I'm gonna do public records requests for all business licenses and those conditional use permits. And if I see that that's being misadministered and someone is getting to fill in that spot and, you know, and, and giving um, leverage to come in after, you know, it's lapsed, I will be bringing back an appeal on those business licenses myself or to let it be known to others in the community what I've found. Um, but I think that my um, analysis of the site areas is correct. And sometimes someone gets in early and someone else doesn't get in early. And that's why we have to be very consistent with keeping these very distinctive, um, intensive activities um, on a level playing field consistent with the code. And unfortunately, the fact that these folk, that we've got two in this area, I think does pose a problem to the area and to the peaceful enjoyment of the residents. And I think downtown residents are the salmon in the stream. They're always the best indicator of the health of downtown. And time and time again, I, t I hear from downtown residents, they're not happy, they're leaving, they're selling. And I think I think some of this is some of our operations and decisions like this one. So I won't support. Okay, thank, thank you. you. I appreciate that. I guess I'm just confused because we had really we had the <clears throat> highest calls for service in downtown with some liquor stores that was okay, but this isn't. So I guess I just am confused as to why that is. So anyway, all right. So I have a motion. Um, and a second. second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Opposed. Motion carries. Okay, Madam Clerk, sending it back to you. You know, if I could make a comment too, I think it bears worth saying that I think we heard really good information from both um, Assistant City Manager Ashley Turney and Chief Nance about the, re the need to report to leave your name, contact information, if something's going awry, regardless if it's about this bar or a different bar. And it sounds like they're planning to really increase their ability to respond to those and to aggregate the data and, and hit hot spots before they become fires. So I just, I think it bears repeating that they, that there are mechanisms to address going forward. Maybe not in the past, wasn't working nearly as well. So thank you for coming. We have work, quite honestly, to do on our side. Um, I would love it if you would stay in contact with us. I think that that's really important um, because you live downtown. Uh, we kind of need to know kind of what you're experiencing, what you're seeing. That's really, really critical because we need to do our part. Like I said, their operation is in their bar, but when they hit the streets, that's our problem. And so we need to be better at the things that you're seeing. Um, and I'm glad that Chief Nance was here to address some of that, but also we are making some changes because we are seeing more and more businesses want to be in downtown Reno. So um, it's important that we listen as well to, you know, as we move forward. So the other thing I, I also um, believe that the, these um, SUPs come back um, if there are issues. Because I've seen them come back when we... Um, what is what the jet? Um, what what is that? What's that called? So if I can weigh in, it's not necessarily the SUP that comes back before council because that does become a land use entitlement. However, there are business licenses that are associated with those properties that come before council. Code now reviews each of those existing SUP conditions before the license comes before council. So we have an additional check to make sure that 
provisions are being followed. Right. Oh, it's the Eddie. The Eddie. The Eddie. And and we did put in there that they have to come back. So, Madam Mayor, that was a special condition that we put on every six months. They had to come back for about two years. Mm -hmm. And then after two years, when uh, they essentially got it all clear, they didn't have to come back anymore. But I was waiting to see if we were going to apply that kind of condition, but we did not. But so. I think those are things that we need to look at, especially, and I don't know if we did that with the Eden, but those that needs to happen, um, you know, because you've got good actors and then you've got bad actors. And, uh, I, you know, unfortunately, or fortunately, the mayor hears everything. And um, I've only heard one of wonderful things about your establishment. Matter of fact, I know, uh, I shouldn't know this, but I do know uh, several people that did have their IDs confiscated from your bar. So thank you so much. And you've passed all those checks. Uh, but other ones we, we do have problems with. They're problematic. And um, that's why I came down on the liquor stores when they were our highest calls of service. Uh, so um, just know that we're, we are listening. We're paying attention. So thank you. All right, Madam Clerk, anything else you need? Thanks, Madam Mayor. We're moving on to item J1, which is closing public comment. Okay. We do not have anyone registered. If you're a participant in Zoom and would like to make public comment at this time, please raise your hand. For the record, we did receive 23 comments, which were general in nature or not directly associated with an item after 4 p.m. yesterday, March 26. These have been distributed to the Reno City Council, five letters in favor, 10 letters of opposition, and eight letters of concern. And so with that, we have no hands raised in Zoom. I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. All right, may I get a motion, please? So I have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Motion carries unanimously. I've never seen it where it hasn't. All right. Thanks, guys. Actually, it sounded like